Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we were looking at the nature of how stars change with time and how they look in terms of their HR diagrams. And we saw that stars actually, uh, obey, star clusters had turnoff points and so forth. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look individually at stars and how we look, see how stars live and uh, how they're born, how they live, and how they die, depending upon their masses, how their masses, and to some extent their composition. So this is a schematic that I grabbed off of Wikipedia by R.N. Bailey, and it's a really good schematic that shows the life cycle of stars from various and sundry points in there. And what we see is we see stars, no matter what they are, start off as a great big molecular cloud. They get born in really big star clusters. The star clusters then have protostars in them, and the protostars then become either small mass stars, low mass stars, or really massive stars. The immediate, and they evolve according to uh, their masses, and the bigger they are, the faster they evolve. Uh, stars like the sun become red giants and turn to planetary nebulae and eventually white dwarfs and those cool off over tens of trillions or hundreds of trillions of years. If they have a companion next to them, they might become a nova or it might become a supernova. But if they're much more massive than the sun, then they will explode as a nova, leaving behind a supernova remnant and one of two things. They either might leave behind a neutron star, which, which we see as a pulsar, or they might leave behind a black hole, which we might see with x-ray emission. There also some, there's some details to this that are glazed over, but basically every star is born, it, li it lives a life on the main sequence, as it's dying it does some very odd things, and it's, every star's ac actual death involves repopulating, or most of the stars involve, uh, well not most of the stars, the most dramatic stars uh, and rarest stars empty their contents out into the cosmos for the cosmos to use again in other stars. So really what is happening on the right hand side of the screen actually leaks over to the left. All right, so why do we think this? Because individual stars have tracks with time with over on an HR diagram. So we will call these evolution tracks on the HR diagram. And of course it's the same thing where you have cool stars in the lower right, and hot stars in the upper left for all four of these little diagrams. And so we can look at uh, the luminosity goes low on the, on the bottom and up and very high on the left. And so we have a, a characteristic main sequence. So if we start with ABCD, uh, we have here, we find that they become what are called Bach globules. They contract to form protostars. Then they become main sequence stars. When they die and leave the main sequence, a star like the sun will have will grow to be a red giant, experience a helium flash, become unstable, eject its, eject its outer, core, outer layers to become a planetary nebula, and eventually the core of the star cools off as a white dwarf. And this is what we call an evolutionary track. And every star follows a, an evolutionary track over its lifespan. And the sum of all the stars in their current places in their evolutionary track makes up an HR diagram for a cluster. And so these models and these tracks are computer models because we've never seen and will never see an individual star do this. We're just taking snapshots and knowing the physics of them. So what we're going to do in the future lectures is describe the various states of these of various stars as we know them through computer modeling uh, and how the computer models fit the observations. So once again, we're going to be going through all the stellar life cycles from birth to death to uh, really weird things, their stellar corpses and their remnants. So we'll start off with the birth of stars in interstellar clouds. This time we're going to be talking about the interstellar medium, the space between the stars or that which fills the space between the stars. The thing with when we say medium, we don't mean like medium like television or radio or something like that or the interwebs. No, we mean the gas and dust that is between the stars that fills or at least gently fills the space between it. Most of the space in the Milky Way between the stars is filled with a very, 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 very thin gas, and it's mostly made up of atomic hydrogen gas, which makes up most of it. However, there's bunches of deep, dense clouds that fill up most of the mass of the gas of the galaxy, but not much of the actual volume, and those are the deep molecular clouds.
Then we find young stars in hot gas regions where stars are being where stars are forming and the heat, the the light and intensity from that light, and energetic light is so intense that it actually ionizes the gas. So we have different flavors of the gas between the stars. So we'll call those are the three phases of the interstellar medium. We'll say ISM for short. And the interstellar medium itself is composed of three rough phases. And this came about through studies that started in the 1970s. And the first phase is what we'll call the cold neutral media. And, you know, it, the, again with the word media, meaning the, the thing that through which uh, the, the, the thing that is transmitting data or at least is holding the data, which is kind of a weird way to think about it. It's the medium of the, of the material between the stars. And so we're going to talk about neutral hydrogen, which is what we call H1. That's not high. It is H with the Roman numeral 1. And that means it is neutral and not ionized hydrogen. And then there's H2, which is the molecular hydrogen, or two, uh, two atoms of hydrogen bound together in a molecule. As well as molecular clouds, meaning sm uh, very small diatomic or triatomic molecules that make up a di significant fraction of it. The temperature of these gas clouds are, are very low, just above absolute zero. And they're also some of the densest spots. And dense is kind of a weird uh, word here because when we say dense, when we think only 100 to a million particles per cubic centimeter, that still is a much better vacuum than we can do anywhere in any, any laboratory on Earth by factors of many billions. So these regions, though, that, we, that have this density, are, they take up only about 1% of the volume of the Milky Way, but yet they, can't, they concentrate almost most of the mass of the Milky Way. In fact, they, that's a significant fraction of it. In fact, there's more material in these cold, dense clouds than there are in the stars. Then we have the next phase, which we'll call warm, neutral, or ionized media. And this is either hot, ionized H2 regions, meaning the, there's one uh, electron that's been liberated from the, from the atom, and so now it's H2. And then there's still H1, which is neutral hydrogen. And they reside, reside near star formation regions where stars are heating the gas and making it warm. And the temperatures range between 6,000 Kelvin and about 12,000 Kelvin. And that's what glows. And so this, the, 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 particle, the densities are a lot less than the dense clouds where you can even have only one particle for every 100 cubic centimeters. And the typical size for a cubic centimeter is that of a sugar cube. So imagine that a sugar cube a hundred sugar cubes stacked around each other, and there's only one atom inside that volume. That is an enormously, enormously good vacuum, but still, uh, that's part. That's what we see when we look at these glowing clouds. Those are areas where we have this enormous glow, and you might think, oh, there's a lot of stuff there. No, it's almost completely rarefied. It's just that the areas are so incredibly large, and there is so much about them that they glow enough that you can see that, but the, but the actual densities of the areas that are doing the glowing are extraordinarily low. So they're very, very, very thin, and we would call it warm, but that would be pretty hot to us if you went over there and went and just actually sampled that gas. And finally, there's another interesting area called the hot ionized media, which is, the, is strictly ionized, and it emits an X-rays. <clears throat> it emits an X-ray light, and it's composed primarily of hydrogen, but it also is composed of ionized heavier elements such as iron and nickel and so forth. And they're the hottest zones of the Milky Way, and they make up the bulk of the volume of the interstellar medium. But they make up the bulk of the volume, but they don't make up the bulk of the mass, which is interesting. So they spread out because they're so hot, and the temperatures range between a million and 10 million Kelvin and can be observed in x-rays. They're extraordinarily thin because they only have like one ten thousandth or one hundredth of a particle per cubic centimeter. So now you've got to line up 10,000 sugar cubes in order to get one particle instead of just 100 like before. And these regions are made up by when you have a supernova type star explosion, they'll shock the, the gas into heat and then it'll heat it to that temperatures. And then they'll rise up out of the plane of the Milky Way, just like we see in this in the top image. And that makes up what we call the galactic corona. And so this is evident when we look at the Milky Way later, we're going to see pictures of the Milky Way where we have X-ray emission. In fact, let's go take a look at those. So 
The Milky Way and optical light shows us some of the interstellar medium. We see not just the starry background and some of the stars above and below, but we see dark clouds that, that, that obscure our view of the center of the Milky Way, and that obscuration is dust and gas in the way. But if we look in, say, hydrogen emission from 21 centimeter radiation, and 21 centimeter radiation occurs when a neutral hydrogen atom, the electron in it changes from spin up to spin down, and that's a very, very, very tiny amount of, amount of energy, but yet it emits it in radio frequencies at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. And we can see that the radio frequencies of 21 centimeters tends to be strongly collimated across the plane of the Milky Way with some diffuse clouds going above and below. And so the, the, the height, we call it a scale height of the Milky Way, is very, very low and confined. So the cold dense media is confined to the plane of the Milky Way quite aggressively. And then we can see how it mirrors with respect to, say, carbon monoxide emission. So CO is two atoms. It's a molecular gas called carbon monoxide. Don't breathe it. Not good. Get out of the house if you if there's carbon monoxide poisoning. You know what that's like. But So there's carbon monoxide all throughout the Milky Way. That's really bad, I guess. But we're not going out and breathing that, so no big deal. Anyway, so we see these are clouds of, hydro, of carbon monoxide, which also radiate in, in uh, microwave wavelengths. And this is a map of that, of those gases, taken by the European Space Agency's Planck probe. But the carbon monoxide is used as a tracer for the molecular hydrogen, which doesn't emit pretty much anything that is easily observed. So molecular hydrogen, uh, but the carbon monoxide gives a much better tracer of it. And we know that there's a lot more uh, molecular hydrogen near where the carbon monoxide is. So we use that as a tracer. Now if we look at the hotter media, which is the H-alpha, which is ionized uh, hydrogen gases, we start to see that there's puffy glows all over the place, and it's not necessarily directly confined to the plane of the Milky Way like this 21 centimeter radiation is. And these are places where we call star formation. So this is hot interstellar media with the temperatures approximately 8,000 or so degrees or 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Next, we have an X-rays, which demonstrates the galactic corona. We see these huge bubbles and loops of gas that go above and below. So you can see that they go way high, and this is from the ROSAT satellite. And this is, this is what we mean by it occupies a much larger volume. It's not confined to the Milky Way. It looks like it's well above and below. So other places that we can see the, in the effect of the interstellar medium, and now we're going to, it's pretty picture time, and this is the most fun, one of the most wonderful elements of looking at star formation uh, that we're going to talk about in the next few lectures, is the pretty pictures. And this is the North American Nebula off to the left, and the North American Nebula was, uh, was to, this is a visible light image uh, compiled by DeMartin, but it, it draws from the Digital Sky Survey, the Palomar Digital Sky Survey, and you can just make color images of it if you go download that stuff. On the right-hand side, though, is from the Spitzer Space Telescope, which looks in the infrared at multiple wavelengths and shows emission of dust, and emission of warm dust, cold dust, and gas. And so in infrared, it looks different than it looks in visible light because we're looking at different processes. And we see the dark band that goes across the middle of the nebula it corresponds to actually some warm, dusty clouds in infrared. So that dark band is actually warm dust. And if we look where the North America sort of feature is on the left, we see it doesn't really glow much in infrared, and that's because it's hot ionized, um, ionized hydrogen gas, which is warm, so it's not going to glow in infrared because it's too warm for that. So we have four different views of that, one of them invisible and infrared combined. So this was done by Spitzer Space Telescope Group at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they just put this together to help you see the views. So here is a combined view of the Digital Sky Survey infrared with the Spitzer image, and we see the, the, the dusty appearance of the reddish dust cloud that goes across the middle. And now the bluish glow is then, they've replaced the pink of hydrogen with, the blue, with a bluish glow. And, but that highlights the, the dusty cloud. So now we get to see the dust in the background, which is very interesting because that shows us where stars are being formed. And then we look specifically at a different wavelength that shows us the interior of the clouds and we get to see different aspects of it. And then it's being blocked. We see a little tiny nodule in the center left where, where it's dense enough that actually we don't see anything through it. 
And finally, we get to see the, that, that dense star-forming region that's in the lower left that highlights that very tiny baby stars, which are like little points in red. And that's what we're looking at here, is the highlighting that specific area of looking at young stars being formed in a very, very, very dense molecular cloud. That's what I was talking about at the beginning, where we were talking about very dense, small regions. This is a much more massive region because it's collapsing and forming stars. The other region is much larger around it, but it's much more rarefied. And so this is a dense, highly dense region and surrounded by a hotter, more rarefied, thin region. And so when we look at that, we have all sorts of things that we can see. And so let's focus in on the nature of what happens when we try to observe those dark areas. And interstellar matter, it's mostly just gas and dust. And what's funny is, is that we think, of, oh, it's just really complex sort of cloudy structure or all sorts of stuff. What is that? No, it's really actually quite simple. The clouds are turbulent. They're, they move around. They're warm or cold, but they're mostly almost completely hydrogen. Remember, it's 75% hydrogen, about 25% helium. And all the rest is just really, really, really trace amounts. But this cloud that we're looking at, Barnard 68, is a dust, and the dust that we talk about is actually like soot or smoke, and the larger clumps of particles are, are really quite tiny. The, the dust particles that make up this are about the same size as cigarette smoke, and are only composed of a few hundred or a few thousand atoms. And so why does something so small actually make the starlight behind it black? Well, it's because there's a lot of it. So this is a beautiful picture by the uh, by European Space Agency, European Southern Observatory, that actually highlights a very interesting feature called interstellar reddening. So in the center of this dust cloud, all the light is being blocked. But if we look on the edges of the dust cloud, we see that some of the stars look red. And the reason that they look red is because as the light passes from behind of behind stars through the dust cloud, it preferentially absorbs and scatters the blue light of the spectrum. So we're left with the red light, and so it looks like it's making the stars red, but it's not actually making the stars red, it's actually just simply removing the blue light, and so we just see the red light. And why we think about that is that look at the, at, compare the stars that, are, that seem very red on the edges of the cloud compared to the red stars that are outside, away from the cloud, and we see that those red stars are really bright. So we're looking maybe at some deep, uh, some very extraordinarily bright red stars on the far side, but their light would be brighter except that it's being dimmed and the blue light is being removed. And, that pro and if we look in longer wavelengths of light, meaning infrared, we can see more through it because infrared light will pass through this dust and gas, or pass, pass by this dust. In fact, the wavelengths of infrared are longer than the size of the particles, and since they're longer than the size of the particles, they don't, they're not affected by the particles, and so they pass through. And now we can see it's like the, the dust cloud isn't even there, or at least it's ghostly. So this is a longer wavelength view by the European Southern Observatory. And finally, we can look at various wavelengths of light, starting from in the upper left, at that's uh, 44, uh, 0.044 microns, or specifically that would be 4,400 uh, angstroms. So that's well inside the visible light, and that's on the far blue end of the spectrum, so we see that it's all gone, right? And then we look at 55, 0.55 microns, which is 5,500 angstroms, which is more bluish, and or more greenish in the visible light, but it's blocking that too. Now then we get out to 9,000 angstroms, well red of visible light red. We see that it's the cloud looks kind of smaller, and that's 0 0.90 angstroms, uh, uh, micrometers in the upper right. And for some bizarre reason, they decide to go around rather than go back to the left and around. So go down and to the right at 1.25 microns which is then 12,500 angstroms, and that's very long wavelength infrared light, or at least the beginnings of, of near infrared. And now the light is getting through, and we look at 1.65 micron, and it's really starting to get through, but by the time we get to 2.16 microns, which is 21,000 angstroms, the light's pretty much getting all the way through, and the, light, the dust cloud is not even being seen by that wavelength. It just kind of passes through it. It's the same kind of way that the light is passing through because it's large wavelength. In the same way that when you take a set of like little, if, if you take a beach ball and roll it across a whole bunch of little pebbles, 
it won't see the pebbles. It'll see the like it's like a roll, but like a like a whole bunch of pebbles. The beach ball will roll across a thin level of pebbles, and just smoothly. But now, if you try to roll a pebble across a roll of pebbles that's about the same size, it'll get bounced around as you roll it across. In the same way, the wavelengths of light, the long wavelengths of light, are like a big beach ball going across the pebbles. It just doesn't see them. It doesn't perceive them. And so that's what the 2.16 micron is. But when we look at the 0.44 right above it, that's like looking at wavelengths of light that are almost the same size as the particles themselves, so they really get bounced around as they go through, and so therefore they get absorbed, and you don't see through it, so they get lost. All right, so that effect is called interstellar reddening, and we describe that extensively. But what we see is they got the cloud, the light, the starlight's coming from behind it, it goes through it, and as it goes through it, the light gets scattered or absorbed, and the stellar absorption lines stay the same wavelength, but all the blue light just gets removed. And so you can still tell the stellar type, the stellar spectral type, like we talked about spectral types before, but the stellar spectral type is not changed, you just lose a lot of the light. So you might think it's a redder star, like, oh, it's an M-type star because they're red. No, but look at the absorption lines. They're, they're the absorption lines of a bright blue star. So the blue light is just being absorbed away. And that's called interstellar reddening or interstellar extinction. And interstellar extinction is something you see when you look at a sunset. And that reddening that you see in the sky is because the, the sun's light the, the reason you can look at a sunset and the sun looks red is because the blue light gets scattered away from your eye and so all you're left with is the red. And the reason that you have a blue sky during the day is because someone else has a red sunset. And that blue light in the sky is from all the, sun, all the sunlight from all, being scattered around the sky because blue light is easily scattered. And in fact, the particles in the, in the Earth's atmosphere are about the same size as blue wavelengths of light. So the, the exact same process is going on in the Earth's atmosphere with respect to clouds and just the atmosphere itself where blue light is easily scattered and red light not so much because it's longer wavelength. And so that's why we have a nice blue sky is because of all the pretty rain sunsets all across the globe, all everywhere. So here's some really cool interstellar scattering demonstrations. We have Barnard 68, that one that we were talking about a while ago, uh, for extensively. But then you got the really cool Snake Nebula, and these two are right next to each other in the sky. And this is from the Palomar Digital Sky Survey, and we're looking in the in the blue. We took a pic. Um, this is a picture from the blue uh, blue filter on the on blue filter blue emulsion filter set from Digital Sky Survey. And if we look at another one, this is another one called the Pipe Nebula. Oops, I skipped the Pipe Nebula. Is all sorts of wonderful uh, darkness. And it used to be thought that these things were holes in space, or maybe there were no more stars in that direction. And in fact, people thought that this was like the edge of the galaxy or something, but past that there was nothing. And that was an early thought of early astronomers doing photographic studies of dark nebulae like these. And they ended up just being dark nebulae, not the edge of the galaxy. And a good friend of mine who did the major set of studies, his name was Bart Bach. And Bart Bach was, was a stu uh, thought that back in the 1950s and 1940s, he published a paper in 1947 hypothesizing that these things were actually gravitationally collapsing and this is where stars would form. And so they're called Bach globules. And Bart Bach was a friend of mine when I was a little, little, little boy. And he uh, said, you've got to come down to Der Kitt Peak and see Der Stars. And he was this wonderful Dutchman. Big old hairy eyebrows, and they stuck out everywhere. He was, he was a wonderful man. He used to like to have a bottle of scotch and, and, and yell at radio astronomers. That was one of his favorite things to do. Anyway, Bart, Bart was known as a, one of the great observational astronomers, and these globules still keep his name today as places where over-dense regions where stars are forming. And one of the more prominent Bach globules, actually more, it's not really a globule, it is a dark dust cloud. The Horsehead Nebula shows off this and demonstrates many aspects of the interstellar medium. It has cold areas, it has hot areas, and it has extraordinarily hot areas, as well as deep, deep, uh, dark cold areas as well. So the pink glow is from hydrogen, and it's hot and heated to, uh, to ex excitation uh, by nearby very hot stars. But you can see that there's a dark nebula, 
which is the Horsehead Nebula dead center, and there's also dark nebulae off to the side that seem to be providing some of that interstellar extinction. You can see the clouds of gas around it, which seem to block some of the background light. We also see the flame nebula off to the left there below one of these uh, below these lights. And these stars are all part of the Orion belt. And so you, if you went and looked at Orion's belt, you would definitely you could you could actually see some of these things. So I invite you to go look at some some of the, the color the, the nebulae surrounding Orion's belt. But let's zoom in on the Horsehead Nebula itself because it's one of the more prominent dark uh, nebulae in the sky and it has such a wonderful name and, a, and it's been studied extensively by lots of different people. And here is a picture of it by uh, Adam Block at Mount Lemmon Sky Center at University of Arizona, uh, which really highlights the, the, uh, the hydrogen gas, which is interesting. You notice those wispy streamers in the background as it evaporates off. And we also have a different kind of nebula, which is a blue nebula. And in fact, it's the same stuff. It's a reflection nebula, and the light is reflecting off of it. But the Horsehead Nebula is, even if we zoom in even tighter, we see some really interesting features of these cloud-like structures, and it's actually in motion. So there is, it does look turbulent. It looks like it's actually plowing upward and above and turning over. But remember, the size scales are on the order of light years. So this isn't moving like fast, 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 although it is moving with some great speed, maybe tens or hundreds of kilometers per second, if not, maybe not even that fast. But I don't. I can't remember this actual study. But that might be something as a good assignment to go look up. How fast are the clouds moving in the Horsehead Nebula? In any event, the pink hydrogen glow in the background is it illuminates the the Horsehead Nebula. But very recently, the Hubble Space Telescope took a look at this same same object in infrared, and this is the view in the infrared that was released in 2013. And when we look in infrared imagery, we now then see the cloud of gas and dust as warm dust that's glowing in infrared. But yet the hydrogen gas doesn't glow in infrared, and all of a sudden we can see through the veil of it to see everything in the background. And now we see the Horsehead Nebula not as a horsehead, but as a as a as a turbulent cloud that's coming up out of the uh, out of the uh, out of the clouds below it, and an over dense region that where things are occurring. So if we then then uh, 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 we can then take a, a stronger view of it, and this is an interesting movie, a fly through done I believe by Frank Summers at Space Telescope, to actually try to dimensionalize it and 3D eyes the view of the the Horsehead Nebula as what it might look like we were flying at it at, you know, well, much faster than the speed of light, I can tell you, because this thing is on the order of half a light year or so in size, or light, year, light years is its size scale. But we can see all sorts of little tiny red dots, and those are very tiny red dwarf stars in formation around it. So what are some things that we can learn about specifically about the nature of these dust dark clouds? On the left hand side we see the view in optical, then the infrared view, a longer infrared view we see some other stuff, and then if we look in radio light which is the carbon monoxide 3-2 transition which is which is a transition, I believe, either as a vibrational transition or a rotational transition of the carbon monoxide atoms, and it's such long wavelengths that it only admits those things as, and these are tiny transitions in light, rather than the atoms jumping up and down, the electrons jumping up and down. Basically, they're either vibrating faster or slower, or rotating faster or slower. And that's what the radio emission's from. And the submillimeter radio emission on the right-hand side shows over-dense regions where stars are forming. And so we can look at these cold molecular clouds as either contoured maps with maybe even much more exotic sorts of things, which are uh, hydrogen, carbon monoxide, uh, smaller at, uh, 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 molecules of four atoms that are bound together. And those emit in radio wavelengths as well. And so it's kind of, we find inter, interstellar water as well as other things. And some, some, actual, some molecules such as ethyl alcohol have been found, formaldehyde has been found. Long organic molecules have also been found by their, by their signatures in radio frequencies, and these appear in these giant molecular clouds. I know it's talking about the, the neutral hydrogen, or H1 regions, and this is what we mean by that spin-flip transition. The proton and electron can be spinning 
with the same orientation for their spins. And this is kind of a weird way of talking because they really don't spin like this, like little balls, but there's a quantum number that approximates angular momentum or it actually is the angular momentum as though, it's or as though it has a spin axis. And then when this spin flip transition occurs, the photon that gets emitted when the electron jumps or flips and goes as they spin the opposite direction is a lower energy state and emits 21 centimeter radiation. We can make large maps of the Milky Way doing that. And in fact, there's a carbon monoxide map of, of, a, of a tighter view, as we saw from the Y spacecraft before. And we're going to kind of get close to finishing it out by looking at some other wonderful images because this is the pretty picture lecture and we're looking at dark globules and you know it's a bot globule because Bart you know Bart Bart big Bart with his scotch in his eyebrows he would love to have looked at this in the Spitzer image but he, he passed away uh, well before in the 19 in 1980s so wonderful old man who gave us a tradition of looking at the star formation regions and looking at the galaxy in its whole and here's another example of a of a dark dust cloud with a hot region with us with an H2 region sitting in the middle of it. So this is what are what we're we looking at with the interstellar medium, and we're going to be looking at all sorts of aspects of the interstellar medium and exactly how stars form from the interstellar medium, protostars, uh, giant molecular clouds, and we'll talk about that stuff next time. We're continuing down the path of the interstellar medium and the stuff between the stars and the Milky Way. And so we're looking at giant molecular clouds. And these are enormous, enormous regions out of which stars form. And so what we're looking at in the background is European Southern Observatory's view of the Lagoon Nebula, an extraordinarily high definition view. And I'm kind of highlighting with the word the edges of the Lagoon Nebula, which branch out into, into darkness. But that darkness actually belies a huge number of, star, of, of, of a huge amount of cloudiness in the background that's not being illuminated by the baby stars. So these giant molecular clouds are actually the places where star formation is occurring in the densest, most, uh, the densest regions. And so these are the, the homes of stars. So let's go back and look at the nature of what the sun is. When we talked about the sun, we found that it was about four and a half billion years old. That's how old it is. That's how long it's lived. It's got another five and a half billion years left before it's dead. But we find that today it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, meaning gravity and pressure are in balance. Meaning if you push on a little bit, the interior pressure goes up because it gets hotter and it pushes it back out. Or if it's pushed out too much, gravity says, no, 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 you went too far and pulls it back together. That's, that's hydrostatic equilibrium. It's also in thermal equilibrium right now because there's an amount of energy that's leaving the surface of the sun and that's being replenished down in the core of the sun by the interior, by the, by, the, by the fusion that's happening deep in the core. So there's a flow of energy from the inside all the way out, and that's, and that's a thermal equilibrium. But of course it ends, right, because the, the fuel eventually runs out. But for now, it's in thermal equilibrium. How did it get this way? So there are two things that must occur. First, it must form some dense protostar. And then after that, you establish thermal equilibrium. And then that's the pre-main sequence phase. So there's really two sets. you got to do one, then the other. Hydrostatic equilibrium means it's in balance, but then deep in the core, there must be something that generates the heat, and that's the pre-main sequence phase. When are stars actually born? So we can find out that by looking around the Milky Way. And uh, the space between the stars is called the interstellar medium, and it's filled with gas and dust, and the dust that we see that fills the interstellar medium is the size of a roughly cigarette smoke. And cigarette smoke is only a few microns in size, but if you take a cigarette and puff it into a white light in a darkened room, you see a blue smoke. And that's because particulates that are the size of, of the cigarette smoke preferentially uh, reflect and scatter blue light. It's not because the particles are blue. It's because they scatter blue light more easily than they scatter red light. So the dust in the light looks blue. Now, most of the volume of the Milky Way is filled with this enormous, 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 thin, diffused, hot, diffused uh, atomic hydrogen gas. It can be very, it can be cold on the order of a couple hundred Kelvin, but it can also be very hot 
and just to hot enough to glow. Embedded within all of this volume, though, are these enormous clouds that are very dense, that, are mole that contain molecular hydrogen, and they're cold areas. And this is where young stars form. And, that, and all young stars are found in these dense gas-rich regions, and they're found next to these clumpy areas where there's, where there's, strong, where there's big clouds. So we should find stars forming next to where the stuff is that they can, they're formed from. And these things are called giant molecular clouds. They, uh, they're interstellar clouds, mostly of molecular hydrogen gas, and then filled with the dust between them as well. They take up about 1% of the volume of the Milky Way, but they take up more than half the mass. And half the mass of the Milky Way isn't just stars, it's this gaseous clouds and clouds of gas and dust. And they make up an enormous amount. So the stars you see in the sky don't make up the dominant amount of mass. And this is what we're talking inside the sun's orbit, about half the mass of the Milky Way. And the sizes of these clumpy things, these clouds, are between 5 and 200 parsecs. So they're quite enormous, much larger than the individual stars that make them up and, or that, that form out of them. And the masses of these huge clouds can be between 1,000 and up to 10 million times the mass of the sun. They tend to be much, much colder and uh, almost a few dozen degrees above absolute zero. Uh, with the de and with the clouds that are permeate the Milky Way, they have very low densities between about a hundred and a thousand molecules or particles per cubic centimeter. And the core, though, when we find core like cloud cores, they're much more dense between a hundred thousand and a million molecules or atoms per cubic centimeter. Now, if we compare that to nearby the sun, the interstellar medium near the sun, that's about one, which it is only about one molecule per particle or cubic centimeter near the sun. So clouds are much more dense than near the sun, and the molecular cores are even more dense. By comparison, if you go and look at the uh, at, uh, at, ma at, at, at the vacuums made in laboratories, there are many, many tens of billions, if not trillions of molecules per cubic centimeter. So even though the objects that we see that we call giant molecular clouds, we can't see through them, but that's not because they're made of solid stuff. They're better vacuums than we can make in any laboratory on Earth. It's just that they're so incredibly vast that they scatter all the light and absorb the light that passes through them. And it's interesting because something that starts off as 200 parsecs in size eventually ends up a few th tens of thousand, uh, uh, a few hundred thousand kilometers across. So it's an enormous drop in size scale. So you have to collapse the cloud. So let's see what balances it against that collapse. And the stuff that's inside a giant molecular cloud is either neutral hydrogen, H1, which is just a, an atomic hydrogen, in the upper left, that's a proton with orbited by a little electron. And now if it's hot, though, it'll be an H2 region, that reach HII, where it's Roman numeral 2, and now it is an ionized proton with an ionized electron, and they're zipping around. It's electrically neutral because there's an equal number of each, but they're free from each other, and that must be some, that must mean they are close to some hot ionizing source. Now if it's truly cold, the atomic hydrogen will bind together and dense. If it's cold and dense, it'll bind together to form molecular hydrogen, where the two, the two protons then share an electron and form an, a molecular bond. And in such environments, we also find uh, uh, molecular carbon monoxide, both of carbon-13 and carbon-12, where there are different isotopes of carbon. And then we also find ammonia and methane and such things like that in, with, uh, with quadratomic molecules such as these. And so these are the kind of molecules you find, and they're very small molecules. But these are the kinds of molecules that scatter blue light in just the same way that particles do. And there's, there's also dust particles, which would be made up of little clumps of these molecules. Not very big, but just big enough to, to uh, be about the same size as cigarette smoke. Now there are three phases to the interstellar medium, and we're not talking about all of them this time. Before we talked about the hot ionized medium, which is to a million to 10 million Kelvin, and those are galactic clouds that rise well above the plane of the Milky Way. But if we look at the cooler areas, the warm and neutral ionized media, which, is, which can be uh, either ionized, uh, ionized hydrogen or a neutral hydrogen, uh, between 6,000 and 12,000 Kelvin. It's mostly the upper right-hand one. These arrows are a little bit dodgy with respect to that. So we're looking, the top one is definitively ionized and it goes way above and below. 
but the warm and neutral one is between 6,000 and 12,000 Kelvin. So we see some of the effect of the upper right-hand image. And the, the densities then are only about a one one-hundredth of a, of a particle per cubic centimeter. And it's even more thin on the much hotter areas. But now we're talking about the cold stuff, which is more like the bottom image and the right-hand image, which are evident only from the molecular hydrogen from the Milky Way. That's what the NW stands for. The Milky Way emission from 21 centimeter radiation, as well as carbon monoxide emission, which will be cloudy and clumpy like we see below, where the densities are between 100 and thousands of particles per cubic centimeter. And the temperatures are really, really low. And this is where, the, where stars are forming. Not the hot stuff, but the really, really cold, dense stuff. And so the molecular cloud, such as the uh, Eagle Nebula here we see, which is in the scent, which is, in the, which is a prominent uh, molecular cloud that's part of the Eagle Nebula. Now these things are self-gravitating. It, it doesn't matter that there's a, they're a couple light years long like these are, but they contain, even though they are diffuse, they are self-gravitating. And they contain mostly hydrogen. Even these objects that you're looking at mostly are hydrogen, but then there's these dust grains, and the dust grains are what that absorb much of the ultra infrared light. The, they, of course, they, they occupy the, these giant molecular clouds are between about 30 or 50 or about half of the mass of the entire Milky Way galaxy. But they only occupy one, about 1% 1 of the volume. So these are, these are tight little things. But they're, by little, we mean a few, a few hundred uh, parsecs or so, between five and 200 parsecs across. But then when you get to the cores, like you see in these pillars, um, the pillars of creation in this eagle, this Hubble image, this is where stars form. So how do stars form? Because you got to take a cloud and you got to collapse it. So there's some things that keep it from collapsing. And so we have this diagram on the upper right of kind of what a cloud might look like. So you got this ball of hydrogen in the upper right and then in an empty space. So if you have a ball of hydrogen, the only thing that's going to be supporting it, it might have some internal pressure from, the, uh, from just the motion of the gas inside it to try to push it out. But then it'll be self-gravitating to try to pull itself together. So the potential energy from the gravitational pull and will be balanced by the kinetic energy of the motion of the gas inside it. So we can then take the kinetic energy and we can add another term that pushes from the outside. Maybe there's a shock wave that comes along and whacks it. Or maybe two of these clouds smack together or the winds collide. And so now you've got extra kinetic energy from, from external pressure that might try to push it together. And so now that's what the red around the blue cloud seems. is like something's pushing it. Maybe something comes and kicks it and then it starts the process. This then creates turbulence inside of there, and the turbulence then balances it against the pressure. So that's the next thing, is that you, you whack a gas and it becomes turbulent. In the same sense that when you take a, take a little bit of, of milk and pour it into, into coffee, it doesn't really t show those turbulent little flows until you stir the coffee. So those are the turbulent little swirls, and that tends to balance out the, the pressure. So now you've got motion, additional bulk motion, that then stirs the cloud. This adds more thermal energy and also contains kinetic energy, but that still balances, attempts to balance the potential energy from it gravitating together. And then you've got an additional energy that tries to either push it or pull it across, and that motion may create a weak magnetic field that then adds together, and all of these things balance out, uh, hopefully, in the cloud, the turbulent motions with an ionized gas or a lightly ionized gas, because now it's warm or maybe hot, has a, has a tiny magnetic field, but that's just enough to actually cause additional motions throughout the cloud that can dissipate it. And so if you have, an equi you have some sort of uh, it, a, a magnetic field associated with it, and there's turbulence, there's kinetic energy from turbulence, there's kinetic energy from heat, there's kinetic energy from, from uh, heat, meaning the motion inside the cloud inherently, and there's kinetic energy that comes from being pushed upon, and it's all trying to be pulled together by gravity, and the magnetic field is trying to pull it together too. And if it's in some sort of equilibrium, then you've got some sort of crazy cloud, but it's a wibbly, wobbly, glibly, globbly, ugly mess, 
And that's what all of them tend to look like. And they have this dense sort of core that's being pushed from the outside and there's all sorts of turbulence and then we see like the Eagle Nebula. So this is a schematic of what's going on with this tur with all this energy uh, supplied by weak magnetic fields. Anyway, so it'll be so, so a giant molecular cloud is held up by its own gravity by internal pressure, and that pressure comes from internal heat. It also comes from pressure from magnetic fields. So that that's the thing that holds it up. And if the gravity becomes larger than that internal pressure, if somehow the gravitational field becomes larger, and how that happens is because you got to push on it. And that's from, if it happens from clouds colliding, maybe two clouds collide, maybe there's a supernova that causes a shock that pushes it together, maybe it passes through a more dense region of the Milky Way by passing through a spiral arm where there's more stuff in the general vicinity, and then you get some collapse of the giant molecular cloud to form more stars. So then when it falls apart, these giant molecular clouds form clumps. And the clumps can be really small, down to a tenth of a parsec, which is still really enormous, right? A tenth of a parsec is about a three, uh, three ten, uh, like uh, like, uh, th like three tenths of a thirty percent of a light year. So the parsecs are about three light years. So this would be about uh, like 0.3 light years. It's a pretty big thing. So a clump, so these masses of these clumps that are a few solar masses. And the high density clumps are then even more stable, unstable, and now they can start to collapse. And this results in the, the, if you have some sort of shock that comes along, that causes them to fragment into little cores, and those cores have cores, and those cores have cores, and, and so on and so on. And we observe them first where this might occur by the density of the radiation that we see from 21 centimeter radiation. And again, 21 centimeter radiation happens because you have atomic hydrogen and the electron and proton have their spins aligned and the, in a parallel. And then the electron, just in general or just because, and maybe there's just a light disturbance, it has just a little bit more energy than if they're spinning opposite. And so if they're spinning parallel, they have a little bit more energy, and then it can radiate a photon by flipping its spin. The electron flips its spin, and it radiates a little bit of radio light. And so this is where, if we see a lot of this 21 centimeter radiation coming from a place, then there's a lot of the cold gas there. If we don't see much of it, there's not much. So we first look for the cold molecular gas from 21 centimeter radiation, which is this process. And this is where we see the cold molecular gas. It's confined to the plane of the Milky Way in this tight, tight, tight band across the Milky Way. And this is a this is an all-sky survey of 21 centimeter radiation centered on the galactic plane. And so that's what the plane across the middle is, which is the plane of the Milky Way. And as we look at the plane of the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way is at the center of the image and 90 degrees up from the Milky Way, looking straight out of the Milky Way from our perspective, is the top of the image, and 90 degrees south from the Milky Way is the bottom of the image. So this is an all-sky map of the Milky Way projected onto a disk. So we can see some looping, arching clouds, but mostly it's confined to the Milky Way. And then if we look specifically at the radiation, the radiation of carbon monoxide, which is a tracer element for, the, for molecular hydrogen, even the colder spots, we find that this is particularly clumpy, but with a significant fraction of it coming in towards the center of the Milky Way. And if we look away from the center of the Milky Way, it gets diffuse and lumpy. So the vast majority of the gas and dust of the Milky Way is interior to the, to the sun's orbit around the, uh, around the Milky Way. And we see that this, is, this image was taken by the European Space Agency's Planck Space Telescope as they were looking for the cosmic microwave background. And so this is something they had to take into account of to look for the great background. And so those wavy sort of structures, that's because of the artifacts from reducing this image. All right, so what do these globs look like? One of them are called Bach globules, and that's named after Bart Bach, who was a friend of mine when I was a child. And bar, these, are, these are places where there's mostly molecular hydrogen, there's carbon monoxide, uh, there's a lot of helium, of course, because we forget about that because it's always in a form of a gas. 
So there's gaseous hydrogen, gaseous helium, and that's almost everything. And then there's maybe even silicates, which are carbonaceous uh, things. And these silicate dusts would be what we're talking about with the, with the cigarette type smokes. And so carbon is an incredibly common element in the cosmos, so we would expect that to be there too. So when we look at these objects, they're about a couple, like a, like a fraction of a light year across, and they can be up to two to 50 solar masses. So each one of these globules could, in theory, form a star at some point because they're dense enough that they are cores that, that could form stars inside of them if they collapse further, such as Barnard 68. This is another molecular cloud. It's about 500 light years away, and it's all isolated, unlike the Bach globule that we saw before that was in front of an emission, an emission nebula, a pink emission nebula, illuminated by bright stars. But Barnard 68 uh, absorbs the light from the stars behind it, and we see the, the effect of interstellar reddening in the stars on the periphery of the cloud. But the interior of the cloud is so dense that, well, by so dense, we mean it's got about a million particles per cubic centimeter, which is really not a good, which is an incredible vacuum compared to what we find on Earth, that this cloud is in the process of collapsing, and it will either collapse down to make new stars or it will dissipate over time, depending on how much kinetic energy and how much, uh, what the, whether it's collapsing down or if it has enough energy to resist against the force of gravity, like the diagram we talked about a bit ago. And, but such molecular clouds like these are even darker. So this is the Circinus molecular cloud, and this is another space telescope image. Um, what we're looking at is the, this particular thing is dark nebula in the background that looks like it has wings, uh, is, a, is an enormous structure that has almost a quarter million times the mass of the sun filled with huge numbers of things, and that there's even young stars forming. And some of the young stars have become so bright and so intense that they've actually punched a hole and eaten away or dissolved or evaporated the gas around them. And so now we see into the place where the star has formed. And there's lots of different regions inside of here, the two prominent regions, and they're, they're each about 5,000 solar masses. So they could, in theory, make 5,000 masses of the sun. Now we can also see the effect of, so the cloud has got this snake-like shape, but it also has a wispy outer area. If we look on the right-hand side of the image, we see that the view is mostly unobstructed, but if we look in the top center, we see the effect of interstellar reddening because of the cloud that is diffuse above the, the snake-like structures. So the most dense area is at the bottom, the cloud, and the cloud is, is above. So something caused this to collapse so that it would form stars. And it almost looks like a shock wave, right? So it's like we have the, the nice under dense cloud at the top right of the image, and then the middle of the image is where we see a lot of the high density region. But then the lower density region is to say the bottom, at the bottom of the image and off to the right. So it's as though something moved in from the lower right, smashed into it, formed this molecular cloud, and then it started collapsing to make stars. So some shock wave came along. Maybe there was a big supernova that happened out of the field, and that shock wave then impacted this cloud that used to be as diffuse as what we see in the upper right, and then that all bunched together to form this one big cloud and then form more stars. And finally, we look at a, uh, well, next to finally, we see a, uh, of a part of a, an enormous molecular cloud that's so big it almost takes up an entire constellation. That's why we call it the Taurus molecular cloud. It's so big it's almost as large as the entire constellation. And this can only be seen, uh, the red glow comes from submillimeter wavelengths, which is uh, 0.1 millimeters or 0.01 millimeter wavelength roughly. And this filament is approximately 10 light years across. And inside those bright spots inside it are where newborn stars are forming inside this long, long, long filament. And the background image is uh, composed from the Digital Sky Survey, just to put it on top, because the uh, because uh, submillimeter wavelengths don't show stars. So you put a visible light image on top of it. That's why there's two different resolutions. You'll see sharp resolution for the stars, and you'll see kind of low resolution clumpiness in the cloud. And this was taken by, uh, by the European Southern Observatory at the Apex Telescope. And finally, we'll finish off with a Spitzer Space Telescope image from Jet Propulsion Laboratories. We're showing the Serpens star cluster smack in the middle. And then there's a tiny filamentary molecular cloud that goes left and right through it. 
and the molecular cloud is of course the dark region that formed the star cluster and now the star cluster has burst out and has used up much of the cloud to make the stars. Still we're surrounded by the pinkish glow of hydrogen but that pinkish glow is because now the hydrogen is hot or warm because of the baby stars that are extraordinarily hot that illuminate, that not just illuminate, illuminate means shine light on. Actually, they do shine the light on it, but then it react, the, the atomic hydrogen takes the ultraviolet light from all of these baby stars, and the electrons in the hydrogen jump out of their, or, their, electron, their orbits and are ionized uh, out to distances of light years. So the reason this is a pinkish glow is because the hydrogen is ionized out to distances of light years. So you don't want to be next to these bright stars, because if you're next to these bright stars, you'd be getting a heck of a sunburn as your skin would be ionized. See, that's what that means. That's what that pink glow means, and that pink glow of, of ionized hydrogen. But the dense clouds of, 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 that are in the background those things are the remnants of the big cloud that used to be there that the baby stars then formed out of and they'll probably prevent the formation of more stars because well that cloud's getting used up and it'll probably be dispersed by the by the by the bright energy of the young stars which will then evaporate the the cloud itself so these clouds are very temporary structures they flow in they flow out once they start to form stars they then that's pretty much the end of their life as they do, and so then they either get dispersed or they form more stars. And in general, there's a, there's a very thin, diffuse gas to most of the Milky Way, and then it collapses, and it, it might have some turbulence that then brings the cloud together. And that's the story of the beginnings of the star's life. Now, next time, we'll talk about protostars and see how stars are born. Today, we're talking about the interstellar medium, and more specifically, H2 regions, ionized hot regions which are part of star forming areas inside the interstellar medium, the densest places where stars are being formed. Once again, the interstellar medium is a huge amount of gas and dust that lies between the stars. The vast majority of the interstellar medium is, of course, hydrogen gas, either in cold, dense molecular hydrogen cl clouds or in a diffuse neutral hydrogen uh, uh, medium. So vast majority of the, the stuff between the stars here, hydrogen or helium, and then there's pockets where it's more dense that would contain other things besides hydrogen and helium, like carbon and nitrogen and so forth, and small molecules. Again, we talked previously about the phases of the ice interstellar medium. There's basically four, three different phases, the coldest phases, which are, which are just a few degrees above absolute zero, and have the highest densities. These highest density areas are about 100 to 1,000 particles per cubic centimeter. And then you have warm and ionized medium, which are a bridge between ionized hydrogen, H2 regions, and neutral hydrogen, H1 regions. They range in temperatures from about 6,000 to 12,000, and we do see these, not in the yellow arrow in the lower right, but mostly in the upper left is where we see the hydrogen alpha line. That in the upper right, I'm sorry, upper right is where we see the emission of hydrogen alpha in the Milky Way, and in the middle image is, is 21 centimeter radiation. At the top, we see the hottest hydrogen emission, which is ionized hydrogen, which can be up to 10 million degrees. This is part of the galactic halo of hydrogen, which is much, much, much hotter. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about distinct areas that are ionized as well as can just have enough. Uh, there's enough density. They're not so big. They stay permanently ionized. They're not so hot. They stay permanently ionized. They're in the boundary region between the cold gap, the cold media, and the hot areas. And this is where stars form. All right. So there is a strong interaction between the nebula that forms the stars and the stars in the nebula. Very, very strong reaction. And we're going to be seeing this very detailed shortly. And these, and again, where we find young baby stars are always inside of these clouds of hot gas as well. And then we see uh, dusty regions surrounding them as well. So star forming regions happen, uh, are very complex regions in the sky. And they're all made of what we call emission nebulae. So emission nebulae are basically hot, thin gases. 
And if you uh, pass a spectrograph over, the, over them by looking at their spectrum, you'll see that they emit brightly in very specific wavelengths of light. And those wavelengths are typically hydrogen and helium, but you'll also see some oxygen and neon and other elements that are pre prevalent inside the interstellar medium. But prominently, you're going to see the most bright emission lines in hydrogen. That's where the pink glow comes from. That's hydrogen emitting at 65, 63 angstroms. And so here's a more detailed view. And the difference between an emission spectrum, as we saw in the earlier lectures, and an absorption spectrum is that an absorption spectrum has a bright continuum uh, and then dark absorption bands. But an emission spectrum has bright emission lines. And so that's what we're seeing in the bottom spectrum below. That's a very complex emission spectrum, but the vast majority of what we see of as emission spectra for these clouds is predominantly made out of hydrogen. So it's not a, a, you can see through it. Notice that you can see through this gas. Unlike a star, a star is opaque. You can't see through it. So you get a continuous black body spectrum, which provides the continuum below it. And then you get emission, uh, and then you would have absorption from the atmosphere of the star. An emission region will just be transparent to some wavelengths of light and not, transparent, uh, and not transparent to others, depending on how the density of the, of the region. But in general, it's transparent to light, so it is thin, and so therefore it is not in thermal equilibrium, and we get emission spectra like this because the gas is being heated, and as it cools, it emits this light. So the cooling mechanism is emitting the light from someplace. So something's heating it, and it's cooling by this process. All right, again, we can go back to Kirchhoff's laws that we saw way back early in the course. And Kirchhoff's laws say if you have a hot, high, a hot, diffuse gas, and then you pass that light through a prism, you see emission lines. And that's what we see as emission nebulae. And emission nebulae, we might see in the insert that we have here. This has come from the Spitzer Space Telescope, as well as the, uh, the Digital Sky Survey on the left. And the pinkish glow on the left is from hydrogen. And on the right-hand side, we're going to see the infrared glow of, of transparent or semi-transparent dust and, uh, and very small particulates as well. So that's our mission nebulae. So there are four, there, well, let's just look at four sample ones. These come from uh, a textbook. Uh, we have four like Messier Object 8, Messier 16, Messier 17, Messier 20. We're going to focus on Messier 16, which is the Eagle Nebula, and Messier 20, which is the Triffid. Their distance in parsecs, these things are really far objects, but they're all roughly in the same direction in the sky. They're, in the con they're towards the constellation Sagittarius and Ophiuchus. Um, and so they're about to 1,200 to 1,800 parsecs away. That doesn't mean that all emission nebulae are at that distance. It means these are at that distance. Their average diameters, though, are roughly in comparison to what we really want to talk about. They're on the order of about 5 to 15 to 20 parsecs in diameter. And their densities are roughly about the same, about 100,000, 100 million particles per cubic meter. Or we would say that's about 100 or so particles per cubic centimeter. How many particles are there in a sugar cube? But the more interesting thing is the masses, how much material is in these things. They can, and we say solar masses, basically how many suns could you make if you took all the gas and compressed it into one thing? Into, into a bunch of stars, the mass of the sun. So Messier Object 16, you could make 600 suns out of it, and the Triffid Nebula, you could make 200, but Messier Object 8, the lagoon, you could make almost 3,000 suns out of it. And the temperatures are on the average about roughly the same between 7,000 and 8,000 Kelvin, or 9,000 at the top. And that temperature is there that shows you that the gas is being ionized. And so it's very hot gas that's being ionized. So let's look first at the Rosette Nebula, which is one a very, very pretty Rosette Nebula, which is NGC 2224. It's almost about 5,000 light years away. And this image comes from the Palomar Digital Sky Survey, Digitized Sky Survey. And we see that this is in the red. This is the red filter for it. And what we see is the glow of hydrogen gas all around it. There's some dark dust lanes that are involved in it. And then we see a cavity in the middle that's filled with bright young stars. And that's part of the Rosette Nebula itself. And here is, a, here is a different view of it, a color view, that we can distinctly see the pink glow of hydrogen. Always that pink glow is the hydrogen, is hydrogen alpha line, which is at 6563 angstroms. And then we have a hot group of, of young hot stars in the center. 
and that oh, that that ion this whole region that you're looking at on the screen the whole thing the pink region that's ionized and then the interior region that's, that's ionized so hot that it actually cannot recombine to form the gases to form the light there's still gas in that gap it just is too hot in order for the electrons to actually recombine so we have a ring around which the of the stars a cavity edge where it's cool enough for the gas to actually recombine and then emit that light but all around it the light is being emitted by ionized hydrogen at specific wavelengths so this is and that, that specific this is another view of the same exact orientation i twisted a little bit by the wise the wide field infrared uh, explorer and WISE's infrared detectors actually look in the blue. The blue and the cyan show our three in the, at 3,000, at 3,400 and 4,600 angstroms, actually 34,000 and 46,000 angstroms, and the green and the red represent 12,000 and 22,000 angstroms, and that's from warm dust. But the others is the, thir the, the blue and the cyan are from stars. So stars make up the blue and the cyan, and the green and the red are from dust. So you can see there's a huge amount of dust inside of this nebula, and it's emitting this light, and there's almost no dust in the core. And, it, uh, and the red is the longest wavelength of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the dusty wavelength, and we see that's the densest area, and it gets less and less dense as it goes. All right, so if we look at the central area, what we see is something about, a, about 40 light years across, and we see a thing called a Stromgren sphere. And a Stromgren sphere is a cavity that's fully ionized, and the, at, the hydrogen atoms cannot recombine. So we have this kind of gap, and the gap is created because the stars are so incredibly hot that they will not, that they, and they emit so much radiation, that the hydrogen atoms that are there stay ionized, and as they stay ionized, they can't, the electrons cannot recombine in order to emit that light, so they stay ionized. On the edge of it is where the intensity of the radiation drops off enough that the electrons can recombine and emit light. So there, there is a bunch of stuff in there, it's just too hot in order to actually be seen. And those, the reason is those bright stars that bright group of stars at the center, those bright O and B type stars, are so intensely bright that they actually they actually ionize it out to about a light, uh, tens of light years. So that's really fascinating. The intensity of the ultraviolet light from these stars enough is actually enough to ionize all of the hydrogen in its gaseous form out to a distance of 40 light years. That means if you went there, your skin, which has a lot of hydrogen in it, would be ionized and you'd be kind of ablating off you because of the intensity of the ultraviolet. You wouldn't have to worry about sunburn, you don't have to worry about falling apart. That's a really crazy region of space to go into. All right, so we also see that in such things we can look at star clusters, young star clusters. This is the 30 Doradus Nebula and this is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope with the Wide Field Camera 3 that was installed in 2009. This is one of the early ones that they looked at and each one of the colors that they show at the bottom demonstrates a different wavelength band and a different filter that's put in front of the Wide Field Camera 3. The right hand picture is in infrared and we see the blue in very, very long wavelength and the yellow in even longer wavelength. So we see a lot of young stars being formed in these tight, tight, tight groups, and there's still some dusty material left over. On the left, we see visible light, which is kind of a Hubble, a, a Hubble palette, so it's slightly skewed in its palette, but we see the dust and gas that surrounds the star cluster, and the star cluster itself has been formed out of the material in that gas and dust. And so the, the star cluster appears in the right-hand side of each image. And the hottest stars uh, are in the center that have been formed, but then there's this cavity off to the left that's been shockwave, that is probably the effect of a shockwave from a supernova that occurred earlier on. But that cluster of stars was probably formed because there was a, a supernova in that gap on the left-hand side of each image, and each of those then that made a compression that compressed, that strongly compressed, a cloud of gas and dust that then formed the star cluster that we see on the right hand side. All right, so star forming regions. All H2 regions are star forming regions and there's lots of things that we see. We always see stars, young hot stars in those regions and lots of clusters of stars in those regions and there are places where star clusters are forming. 
And the pink glow, and this is an image that's combined uh, from the vis a visible light image from NOAO and then from Spitzer IRAC MIPS, uh, and MIPS instruments on board that. And so the Spitzer Space Telescope gives us an infrared view of it as well as an uh, the visible light on the left. And there we see dark dust lanes. So let's actually kind of zoom in on the Triffid Nebula's M20. There we go. We see on the left-hand side image that there's dark dust lanes that block the light in visible light. We've got this pinkish glow, and what's with the blue? Hmm, that's kind of odd. It's still hydrogen, so what's going on there? Uh, it's a slightly different thing, but if we look on the right-hand side, we see the dusty region, and the dusty region glows in infrared. In fact, those dust lanes, which are dark on the left, are actually kind of bright in the infrared because they're dust, and dust is warm, and warm things emit in infrared, but they block visible light. So you got warm, dusty things that block it, and then the other stuff that doesn't. But there's still a lot of gas and dust there that makes for the blue reflection nebula above. So let's look at those different kinds of nebulae that make up the Triffid Nebula. A nebula, the word nebula just means fuzzy thing in a telescope. That's really what it means. I can't tell what that is in a telescope. It is nebulous. So this image comes from the Anglo, Observ Anglo Australian Observatory, uh, and which is a which place that people do all sorts of wonderful things. So dark, the dark nebulae are dust clouds, and I've got the arrows pointing to them. And so the arrows demonstrate where the dust clouds are that will are over dense regions that may form stars now. And then around it is a pink emission nebula, and that is due to hot emission, hot hydrogen gas. And that hot hydrogen gas is being heated by the bright, 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 young, hot stars in the center of the nebula. And on the outside, we have a blue emission nebula, a reflection nebula, and that's blue because it's scattered light, scattered blue light from the hot stars. So the scattered blue light means that the light from those stars goes to behind the nebula, scatters off of it, and then comes to us. So think of it as a billiard ball, then that is far behind the nebula, and it's kind of a carom shot back to us. So how does that really work? Um, and here's our little diagram, which is really good for looking at the Triffid Nebula. So we have an observer, she's off to the left, and we have our big hot cloud, and it's off to the right. And we can have a dusty dark, a dusty cloud in front or behind, and it can be either side. And what we'll get is that the hot stars make the, make the, make the nebula glow red, and it ionizes the gas. And if it ionizes the gas, it does that nice pink glow because it's predominantly hydrogen. In fact, all of these huge, massive uh, molecular clouds are almost all hydrogen and with trace amounts of other things, but it's always like 75 to 75% hydrogen. So when the hot stars illuminate it, the big, 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 big cloud that would reach very far off to the right on this image, uh, just the place where the hot stars are gets illuminated and then ultra, the ultraviolet light from those stars ionizes the gas and that gas then glows in visible light as it cools off. But those, that, that light then doesn't per, uh, go all the way through to the rest of it because the, there's just enough gas to, to absorb all the ultraviolet light so it doesn't actually go to, go to the rest of the cloud. Now, some of that visible starlight then goes and reflects off of a dusty, dark cloud. And that is what we call a reflection nebula. So you can have the dusty, dark cloud behind it. You can have the dusty, dark cloud in front of it. And the dusty clouds, uh, which are also, also are predominantly hydrogen, but they've just got enough little stuff in there and molecules, that they can reflect blue light. Remember, that's why we have a blue sky here on Earth, is because the molecules in, in the air uh, can scatter blue light more easily. And it's the same exact principle, but out in space. The, wavelength, the, the wavelengths of light are short, and so wave, blue wavelengths of light are short, and they are small with respect to the size of the particles in the cloud, and so therefore they can bounce off the particles. If it's red light or infrared light, then they simply pass through the dusty cloud, and the dusty cloud does not, does not reflect or, or unscatter or scatter the red light. So they'll only scatter the blue light. So you can think of the dusty cloud as reflecting the light, and that's exactly what it does. More like it scatters the blue light in many directions, and we see it as blue. But the red light doesn't get scattered toward us, so we do not see that light. All right. 
So this gives us a really good impression of what the Triffid Nebula is doing. We've got the red dusty cloud, but let's take a really fine zoom in. So this is a wonderful image. We can see some, we can see the effects of interstellar reddening on the periphery of it. We can see the dusty dark lanes. We can see the reflection nebula. We can see hot stars in the center and the emission nebulae from the H2 region, the H2 region, which is the, the ionized hydrogen region in the center. All right. So let's zoom in a little bit, and uh, now we'll, we'll look at this as a Hubble palette image. And now we're going to look specifically at the wide field planetary camera, and we're going to zoom even further in with the wide field planetary camera view. And now we're going to take a look at what the Hubble Space Telescope sees in the center of the Triffid. And this is the characteristic footprint of the Hubble Space Telescope using what we call the Hubble palette of the, with the, filler, the filters of the Hubble Space Telescope. So the reddish area is hydrogen and the bluish area is ionized hydrogen. And the little tiny dots are baby, 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 little, really, really dim stars that are being formed. And in this thing, we see that it's a turbulent region of clouds with the, with the hot, hot stars in the center illuminating and ionizing the edge of that, of that beastly protrusion in the upper left. And we see what's called an evaporating gaseous globule that looks like a tadpole off to the left on the left hand side. And there's also little spicules and things, but there's a jet like structure from the formation of a baby star in the upper left. That's like a jet sort of thing that looks like a little hose that's being shot out. So there's three, there's a protuberance, a dark protuberance in the center of it, as well as a jet like structure that's kind of knotty and wiggly. And then there's an evaporating gaseous globule, which is a very, very dense region. What's funny is those little spiky regions, the spiky dark region in the upper left, not the, not the illuminated jet thing, but the spiky dark region, as well as the evaporating glo globule that looks like a tadpole, those things are easily at the tips uh, hundreds of times bigger than the solar system and would easily contain all of the entire solar system out to uh, 10 to 20 times the size of Pluto's orbit. They're enormous, enormous structures. So if let's zoom in really carefully, and we see the tadpole on the left. We see the evaporating gaseous globule in the center, which looks like a finger-like protrusion out of the main cloud. And we see also other little protrusions just starting on the right-hand side of the main cloud. And those things are little tiny baby stars, and all these little red dots all around are tiny baby stars. And there's something happening that's kind of like a, like a shot out of there. And that is a jet-like structure happening as a young baby star is, a, is coming to life inside of the cloud. And that illumination that we see that glowing from behind, part of that is from the baby cloud and another part of a baby star that's embedded inside the cloud. And the, most of it, though, is coming from the ultraviolet light that is uh, il from the bright, bright, bright star that's up above this image to which the fingers point. Not the jet-like structure, the knotty jet-like structure, but the two finger-like things are pointing at the extraordinarily bright OB-type star in the center that's evaporating these, these structures. So we find all sorts of little tiny baby stars all throughout the Triffid Nebula, and these arrows point to them everywhere, and these are tiny, tiny, tiny baby stars. And on the right-hand side, we see in infrared what they look like. They look like in the right-hand side, left-hand side image, in visible light, you don't see them. But on the left, on the right hand side, you do see them, and those are tiny baby stars. They might be protostars. They have not turned on nuclear fusion in their core, so they are not yet stars. They're called protostars. All right. So let's look at the most fiducial of the great, uh, uh, the one of the greatest uh, nebulae of all, and it is. This is this is a large image taken by Dieter Villach with Astro Cabinet of the Eagle Nebula M16. And we see the great, great, great Eagle Nebula. We see these kind of two claw-like structures. There's a beak above the claw, and there's a hook-like structure for its head, and the wings spread left and right. And this is the Eagle Nebula. In the center of the Eagle Nebula is a bright ionized region, but the whole of the thing is a pink ionized cloud of hydrogen gas with lots and lots and lots of baby stars dusty lanes at the above and through that permeate throughout. But there's some really critical dusty lanes right in the center, the most dense regions in the entire center, 
and we look at the, this NOAO Aura NSF image that was featured on astronomy picture of, a de of the day. This whole structure is about 6,500 light years across, and the whole thing spans about 20 light years, which means these spires that are in the center of it can span to be about four to five light years long. It can be enormous structures in the Eagle Nebula. And here with this particular color choice that we use, uh, for this particular construction of the color, we see that the yellow is more like the hydrogen gas and the pink or the bluish is the reflection nebula from the hydrogen gas. And so let's zoom in on that particular picture. And as we zoom in, we see something that begins to look a little bit more familiar. This was taken with a one meter telescope at Kitt Peak in Arizona, one of the great, one of the great observatories in the United States at Kitt Peak. And so we find the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 took images of it in 1995. This was the Pillars of Creation image and the Advanced Camera for Surveys Wide Field Camera Types 2 and two, two of those images in 2004. This was taken by this was taken by the uh, was taken by a uh, T rector at, at University of Alaska. Anyway, so let's zoom in on specifically the pillars of creation, and here we go. There they are. The iconic image from 1995 of the Hubble Space Telescope is of these pillars of creation, one of the claws of the of the Eagle Nebula, and these are what are called pill these these pillars point at extraordinarily hot stars. They're over dense dust clouds filled with huge amounts of gas and dust that could easily, the left hand image is about four light years long and contains many, many, many baby stars. The most dense regions are at the top of the image uh, of each of these pillars, but the, uh, the, the hot stars above are illuminating them and forcing the, the gas to evaporate. And that's what the kind of wispy glows that are happening there as the gas evaporates from the surface and spallates away into space. But there's these little noduley things all throughout them. And if we zoom in, we can st begin to see these nodules forming. And these are starburst clouds. We see all these tiny, tiny, tiny little nodules and this was the uh, detail from Hubble Space Telescope in November of 1995. And here we see the, each one of those things is easily about 10 to 100 times larger than the solar system, each nodule in the cloud. And so this is where stars are forming. In each one of those, a baby star is forming and enough materials there to make thousands upon thousands of Earths and thousands of Jupiters but mostly it's going to make individual stars. And see how there's lots of little bitty nodules all throughout? That's a cluster. That is a cluster of stars in the process of being formed by, uh, right now inside of this thing. And about 6,500 light years away, there are some uh, people who believe that there was a shockwave supernova that's inside of the nebula that might wipe out these clouds, but there's not enough X-ray emission to really justify that. So that interpretation that these clouds, that the pillars of creation have been destroyed 6,000 years ago by a supernova inside of the nebula uh, and probably aren't true because if you're going to have a supernova, you better have X-ray emission and there's not a lot in this cloud. But the, but the real important point is inside of each of these nodules, a baby star is being formed. And look, there's bunches of them all being formed at once. All right. So the Hubble Space Telescope had a, an update, uh, had its final servicing mission in 2009 uh, by the Space Shuttle, and the Space Shuttle team went and replaced the camera with the advanced camera for surveys. And in 2014, uh, they revisited this in 2014 with a wide field camera three. Comparing and contrasting, we look at some, some areas inside of the field, and we see things are moving throughout. There are jet-like structures that have moved on the order of 20 years. So even though the, the, the image that we see on the left-hand side is approximately two or so light years long, these jets are moving so fast in that inset, <clears throat> which might be about a half a light year long, that these things are moved, that the jets are actually driving something out from there. And so we, we see something going on, and that's where protostars are forming, little baby stars. And so this is the 2014 full visible image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the colors are a result of the fact that the Hubble Space Telescope uses narrow band filters. And so you have to construct a cobble palette. And so it doesn't look like a natural wide band filter like your eye would see. But it is very illustrative, and this color palette is called is what's called the Hubble palette. So those of you that are interested in colors and so forth, Google the Hubble palette, and you'll have a great time. What we see here is that this four light year long set of pillars 
is, is the densest region, and it seems to be separating away because those dense regions are overdense compared to the clouds around them. And they're shielding baby stars because they're overdense, and that's where stars are forming inside of them. And you can see some nice little snaky-like structures well below as well. And so when we look then again with the Hubble Space Telescope, there's another view that we can take with the infrared uh, image. And so the, in addition to the 2014 image with the wide field camera, they also put the UVIS IR imagery on the right. And that shows kind of a ghostly structure, but the infrared image shows scads of little stars. But that also tells us something we already knew, is that 90% of the stars in the sky, or roughly 80% of the stars, or maybe somewhere between 80-90% of the stars in the sky, are much less massive than the sun. And if they're less massive than the sun, then they're K and M type dwarfs. So we don't see them very easily because they're dim and they radiate mostly in the infrared. So we have to use an infrared image to actually see those little dim stars. And that's what we see in this image is the dim, dim, dim of stars that radiate mostly in the infrared. And we see, wow, the, the sky is filled with all these dim stars. And the clouds of gas and dust are, radiate somewhat in the infrared because that's where they're warm. They're warmed by the bright stars. And that warming of that stuff actually allows it to radiate in the infrared. But still, there's some things that are so incredibly cold that they don't radiate in infrared at all. And the rest of the starlight is there. So there's a bit about uh, there's a bit about the uh, the uh, H2 regions, which are star forming regions. There's evaporating gaseous globules, which are these egg like structures that we see throughout. We see that there's hot ionized gas that is done that is done by the very 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 bright hot O and B type stars. The pillars always point at these stars, and each of these pillars could easily make thousands of suns. The gaseous glot, the pillars that we see here, are easily 100, uh, 100 to 1,000 times the mass of the sun and can form many, many, many stars and thousands upon thousands of Jupiters and Earths. But, in, but they only have, they have to get dense enough in order to make that and the collapse of them, the clouds under gravity to form these little nodules is what does that. And that's why we see the dense, the dense region on the right, which does not glow, but then there's a gentle glow in infrared from the warm stuff. So there's a bit about H2 regions and star forming areas where stars always form in these bright, bright, bright areas. So star forming is, is associated with all of that. This time we're continuing on our star formation idea by looking at the nature of protostars. Protostars are the early seeds of stars before stars become what we call stars. So what is it exactly does that mean? It means that stars have a birth, they have a life, and they have a death. And they form in clusters of stars in great clouds made out of the, the giant molecular clouds that we saw before. They form in star clusters that appear in H2 regions and ionized gas regions filled with pillars of gas and dust. And as they form into these groups of stars, many of them, before they shine with the light of fusion in their cores, they contract under gravity and form protostars. So let's look what that means. All right, so once again, we look at the sun, and we're going to take this with respect to the sun. The sun is very, very, very old. It's about 4.6 billion years old, and that's how old it is. And today, we find it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that the pressure from within that pushes the hot gas out from the center is balanced by the gravity pulling all the gas together. Now, it's funny to think that stars are made of balls of gas, and they're totally gaseous. But yet, when people think of that, they say, well, gas doesn't have gravity. Well, of course it does. It's matter. So gravity pulls all things together. It doesn't matter what the matter is made out of, whether it's gas or liquid or solid. It pulls it together. And then the pressure at the core of the star balances it. That. And that balance is what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. And it's hydrostatic because the gas acts as a fluid. And we also say that stars are in thermal equilibrium because in the center of, say, the sun, the sun's uh, power is by fusion reactions, and that fusion reaction uh, provides the energy that keeps the pressure going against gravity. And so that energy then slowly makes its way out to the surface and emerges as light, and that when, however much light comes out at the surface, that's what's actually being produced down in the core. Well, without an without being uh, taking into account, say, the neutrino loss, 
But we've got all the luminosity is basically luminosity of light and luminosity of neutrinos. Add that up together, and all that must balance out the energy that's coming uh, that's produced in the core. Must be the amount of energy that's leaving the sun. And so how did it get that way? That's the real question. And so there's two steps to star formation. The first, the first formation is to form a protostar. And then that is, that is a hydrostatic equilibrium phase where pressure is balanced against gravity. And then you form a thermal equilibrium phase where the energy that's going out the surface, coming out of the surface, is balanced by what the energy being produced in the core. And that's pre-main sequence. So we're going to look at the protostar formation phase as well as the pre-main sequence phase. So where do we see these things born? We see them born in star clusters like we've seen around. Now we know that they're formed because we're looking at the interstellar medium and we looked at, we looked at H2 regions in the previous lecture. And we also looked at uh, uh, giant molecular clouds. Those things are enormous clumps of gas and dust about a parsec or so, tenth of a parsec in size, and they may be larger. And each of these things are about a few solar masses in size. And these clumpy giant molecular clouds have a very, very high density, and they will collapse under gravity. And so as they collapse under gravity, the most dense ones collapse first, and they collapse fastest. And as they collapse faster and faster, the pieces of them that are more dense inside the clouds collapse into other clouds, and those things rip apart inside the cloud and form little clumps that then form uh, groups of stars. So let's begin with the concept. So there's our basic concept. You have a big, 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 big cloud, an interstellar cloud. Something comes along and causes it to contract. Maybe it's a little bit more dense in that region. Maybe there's some shock that comes along and we saw in previous. Something counterbalances the, the motion of the gas and the magnetic field from the turbulence of the gas, and it starts to collapse. And as it collapses, it fragments from one side of fragment into the next. So it makes a bigger fragment, and those bigger fragments turn into littler fragments. And so now the littler stars, or little fragments, come from the bigger fragments. So you got it quarters them and quarters them again. And at some point, they get to the point where the density is high enough that it actually can't fragment anymore. So it's kind of like thinking of teardrops being pinched out of a thing. So they pinch in those little nodules and it pinches them apart. Uh, so they, once you get to under a certain density, it's not gonna fragment anymore. All right, so then you get these adolescent young stars. The interior of the fragments begin, and they begin to heat, because as they collapse, any gas that you compress warms up and gets hotter and hotter, and so they're collapsing under gravity, and eventually they form the surface that's about 10,000 Kelvin, and that is the surface of a protostar. So why do they actually collapse? Because in general, when we look at uh, individual atoms, they're moving pretty fast in these big, big, big clouds. And they move fast enough that, sure, they might get close enough together that they actually could collapse, but they have enough kinetic energy that after they get close together, they spread apart. So something has to come along to actually keep them together. They have to cool off by emitting light. And that's the thermal acid, that is the loss of energy. So once they get to that collapsed value, if there's no way for them to emit the energy that they have in kinetic energy, then they just keep going. But if they somehow interact with each other, uh, and there's various processes by which they can interact, the electrons can interact, the, pro the protons can interact, they can form molecular processes, they can stick and form molecules. There's many ways that they can interact and thus lose the kinetic energy. So if there's some way for them to stick together, then they can, and then that will allow them to contract in the lump. Otherwise, we see by letter C that they would spread apart. So it would go, they fall together under gravity, but if they can't lose that energy, they do letter C. Well, there's a lot of different stages that they can go through when we go through. And, they, and sometimes you see these lettered stages or numbered stages, and they're not really too indicative of things, but it just is a very good helper. Most uh, science, uh, in, the, in general, we look at star formation. Uh, these are not broken down into these stages, but what is done is that this is a nice, helpful way of determining what, what rough area it is and how big they are, what their densities are, and how long they're in these phases. Once a star starts to collapse out of a cloud, once it collapses, it starts, it takes about two million or so years or a couple million years for the star cloud to collapse. It's extraordinarily cold in the center of it and extraordinarily cold in the surface. And it pretty much has almost no, uh, it's only about a thousand particles per cubic centimeter or a, or a billion particles per cubic meter. And the diameter is enormous. It's on the order of a few light years. 
Now, when they start to collapse, the central temperature rises a little bit, and it lasts, and the central temperature is a fragment. It's that first fragmentary set. The density raises by a factor of 1,000, and it drops by a factor of 100 in terms of diameter. And it's really in basically free fall. So we can think of the cloud fragment as free fall. And then it goes into the so when the core temperature reaches about 10,000 Kelvin, that can balance against the gravitational pull. And now we're in hydrostatic equilibrium. And that's the first element of a protostar. The protostar then balances out at number at that third set. The, the density is increased by a factor of a million, and the diameter is again decreased by a factor of, of 100, and now we're about 10,000 degrees in the center. That lasts for about 100,000 years or so, and then about a million years more for something about the size of the sun, it'll be a protostar. And the protostar means the, set, the collapse that occurs gets emitted in the form of light. And so the central temperature is about a million. We still do not have fusion happening in the core, but it's just incredibly hot. It's wildly dense. It's now 10 to the uh, 10, 18, 9, 14, 15, 10 to the 15th times more dense in the core than it was when it was a cloud. The diameter is contracted by a factor of a million, and the surface temperature now has raised to the surface temperature of the coolest of stars. And that's what the protostar range at number four is. And then about 10 million years, the sun would have lasted with a central temperature of about 10 million degrees, as about 5 million degrees, and it cool, and the surface temperature rose up a bit, the central temperature raised even more, and then you had a, a period of deuterium burning, and that would be number five, where deuterium fusion is occurring because that's all the temperature you need to just fuse whatever latent deuterium is in the core in order to, uh, in order to supply the energy uh, to that view that's seen at the surface to balance against the gravity as the as it collapses further. Now, once it gets to stage six, it takes about ten about thirty million years to get to the next stage, which is uh, which is on the order of of about which, which is its first 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 zero age mean sequence time, and it lasts about it it'll, it'll go down to about ten million Kelvin where deuterium burning becomes much more prevalent throughout the entire core. A core structure develops, an envelope structure develops. There is not much left around the star. The protostar envelope is now gone, and the star itself is revealed as an individual object, and the central temperature is incredibly hot, incredibly dense. Now it's over almost, uh, it's, it's 10 to the 22nd times more dense than it was as a, as a cloud. The diameter now has shrunk down to the size of a typical star, about a million kilometers across. And then the last stage is the main sequence lifetime of the star. For the sun, it will last about 10 billion years where full proton-proton chain fusion reactions occur. So if we just look at the stuff from stages one through six, we see that it collapses from a cloud into a fragment. It balances itself by gravity. The, bra the gravitational pull balances itself by the heat coming out from the center. And the protostar itself goes through two phases where it's incredibly hot in the center, but not yet fusion hasn't started. And then finally, deuterium-only fusion has started. But by the time it gets to main sequence, then it's full proton-proton chain fusion that is occurring. Um, and so deuterium fusion means you have to have deuterium in there, and that deuterium uh, hits other protons and other deuterium nuclei but it's not hot enough for a proton to intersect with another proton until the core temperature is about 15 million Kelvin. All right, so how do we make protostars? Well, protostars start out of these cores. Remember we saw like the, uh, the uh, evaporating glasses, gaseous globules in the Eagle Nebula, as well as in the Triffid Nebula and all over the place in these dense star forming regions. The cores start out as low density. They're kind of transparent, mostly transparent. Photons get out. And that keeps the gas cool. Remember, that's how it allows the, that's how the gas can actually collapse, is that the light has to be able to get out such that you can still keep collapsing. So if you get the light coming out and it's not opaque, it can still collapse. But there comes a point where it becomes opaque and then the light gets trapped. So then the gas starts to heat up. Then the pressure starts to build up because the gas is heating up. And that's the old, uh, that's, that is the normal PV equals NKT, which is the ideal gas law. Pressure builds up and that becomes hydrostatic equilibrium because now the pressure balances against the gravity because it's become dense and hot and none of the light escapes. So it becomes basically like a big ball of, of opaque gas.
So now the protocellar core continues to grow because stuff flows down into the core. There's things, if gravity is still working on it, and it's not that it, it's not that it's stopped collapsing, it's that the core is growing because material in the surrounding cloud is simply too opaque to actually let the light out. Now, the protostar phase, as we've discussed before, lasts only up to at most 100,000 years, and it's got this temporary sort of hydrostatic equilibrium because this isn't going to last long because there's stuff raining into the core from outside, and there's but it's still balancing the pressure versus the, uh, the temperature is from the outside, and it remains deeply embedded inside of the parent glass. Now, this is a short-lived sage in the star's life, very, very, very short-lived stage. And because it's short-lived, there's not many of them. And short-lived means they're hard to find because when you do go try to find a protostar, you have to look in very, very special places because if something lasts a long time, it's easier to find and there's more of them. If something doesn't last a long time, there will be innately fewer of them around. And since, uh, since protostars only live a short period of time, that means they're hard to find in the sky. Uh, protostars themselves have disks. They, as they rotate, they have a preferential rotation to the gas, so that actually collapses along the the, uh, the rotational axis, and then matter can fall along the polar the poles of this rotation axis of a big disk, and then matter along the equator falls even faster into it because the, along the equator it falls slowly in because it's rotating around, and so it'll take time for it to lose that rotational energy. So it can fall along the poles, but it'll spin along the equator. And the result is that the infalling gas looks like pancakes. So you get these disc, flattened disks around the equator of a protostar. But eventually, the protostar forms and becomes so hot that the disk of material starts to become cleared away. The heat, from, the heat and energy from the light pouring out from the young baby star becomes incredibly intense and destroys the outer areas of the disk that surrounds the baby protostar. Then some of that matter drains uh, as the disk forms, some of the matter falls onto the remaining star, and the rest might form planets. And in fact, the Kepler Space Telescope, one of the most important results in the last 10 years, actually since uh, God, the last 10 years now, is that the Kepler Space Telescope has found that pretty much every star in the sky has planets, so these protostellar disks form planets all the time. In fact, they, it's very seldom that they don't. And so observations in the sky show that these disks get cleared away in a few million years, and then the dust grains and little pebbles and rocks take a lot longer because those things get cleared and turned into planets, and they become our comets or our asteroids or just basically zodiacal light that we see around the Earth. And these dusty, disc, disc, debris-ridden disks are, are frequently around, found about young, uh, young stars. So how does a protostar then become a star? Well, they shine because they're hotter than their surroundings. Remember, the rest of the stellar, the, the star uh, nursery is just a big cloud of gas and dust. Now, protostars are really, really hot in their cores, and so they emit an enormous amount of light. And they, because they, because they emit an amount of light, they're they're hotter than everything else. So they, we can see them in infrared or visible light, depending on the surroundings. Now, the energy source, if they've got an energy source but you can't do nuclear fusion in the core in order to stay hot. That energy source is gravitational contraction. So as the protostar shrinks slowly, it releases the gravitational energy in the form of heat, which then gets radiated in the form of light. So you take stuff, you take a big cloud, let it collapse under gravity, it gets hot. When things get hot, they glow. And, and by hot, we can even mean 100 Kelvin or 200 Kelvin or 1,000 Kelvin and once or even 4,000 Kelvin. And that gets enough to release the gravitational energy in the form of light. Half of this energy goes into photons, which is the light that we talk about, and the other half goes into heating the core. So some of it doesn't come out because it's dense enough in order to uh, make the kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules go in that, well, no longer molecules because it's too hot for molecules and no longer hot for atoms because they'll be all ionized in the core and the rest of the core becomes uh, heated. So how long can it do this? Well, the reason it can only do this for a very short period of time, comparatively speaking, and we, we call this the Kelvin-Helmholtz time scale. And that's how long something can shine only by gravitational contraction. 
And this is something we talked about when we looked at the age, when people looked at the nature of the age of the sun. And this is the exact process that Kelvin and Helmholtz tried to use to determine the age of the sun uh, when people did not know that nuclear fusion existed. So this, this time scale basically says the gravitational binding energy, which is the uh, mass squared divided by the size of the object, radius squared, and you compare that to the luminosity. So the m squared over r, now where does that come from? Remember the force due to gravity equals the Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of one thing times the mass of another thing divided by the distance between them squared. But the energy that's obtained by something falling in the gravitational field is simply the force times the, force times the distance through which it falls. And g is just some constant. So really we have the self-gravitation of the object is just the mass squared of it because it's all gravitating on itself. It's just self on self, so mass on me. So the two masses are, well, itself. So you can think of it, the gravitational force can be multiplied by the size of it to give you just an m squared over r. Now that's an energy then, because the energy you get from falling from things falling by gravity is simply the force due to gravity times the distance through which they fall. And we can think the distance through which they fall is simply the size of the object. And that gets you the m squared over r. Now that energy gets radiated, radiated uh, light per second. So the L is luminosity, energy radiated per second. So if you take the gravitational potential energy, which is proportional to the square of the mass of the object that and the size and divided by the size of it, and then you divide it by the luminosity of it, you get a characteristic time scale for it to emit all of its energy. So we think about the idea, it's like one solar mass might live about 30 million years as a protostar, and the higher the mass, the shorter the time, because the energy, the luminosity is much, much greater for higher mass objects. So the mass squared over R is roughly the same for most stars when you're talking even one solar mass or half a mass up to like 10 or 15 solar masses, but the luminosity goes up a lot. It goes up by factors of a million or, or, 10, or 10 to the fifth between these small stars and these big ones. So the fast, the bigger they are, the more massive they are, the much, they are much, much, much more luminous for a larger mass. So the mass squared over R does not rise as quickly as the luminosity. So the, the, the Kelvin-Helmholtz time scale is shorter for more massive stars. All right, so this kind of shows the tracks that they do. And we thought about the idea of an evolutionary track or where the star appears on the main sequence as a function of time. So we can have a big, big, big cloud, which, com which could be in the which could be a range of starting luminosities and masses. And if it's a little bitty star, it'll start off fairly luminous, maybe much more luminous than the sun. And then as it contracts, it will get smaller and smaller and smaller and less and less luminous because it's physically smaller. A star like the sun will, will contract much more quickly and have that kind of kinky loop in it. And that's because things are, that, that's like a, a deuterium burning is occurring once it gets to that loop. But even more massive, it goes, it ends on the main sequence higher and higher and higher up. So we look at 50 in solar mass, it is incredibly short um, of time scale on the order of tens of thousands of years to form from a cloud down to a hot O and B type star. And, but a little bitty half mass solar star will take hundreds of millions of years, if not even longer, for it to reach the main sequence on these tracks. So the length of time on each of these tracks is depends on the mass. So the 0.5 solar mass thing will take a long, long, long time to run that arrow, but a 15 solar mass star will rip across that arrow incredibly quickly. And so that's why we see in star clusters and star birth regions, we see the brightest, hottest stars forming first because they form before the cloud gets used up or gets dispersed. But the little tiny ones are prevalent everywhere because they take a long time to form and they keep forming and forming and forming and collapsing and collapsing and eventually they get formed, but not until all the big stars are dead. So high mass protostars, as I said, a 30 solar mass protostar collapses in less than 10,000 years and the collapse proceeds. The core gets very hot until it reaches 10 million Kelvin 
and that ignites the proton-proton chain. But in very massive stars like 30 solar masses, it'll immediately go into the carbon-nitrogen-oxygen or CNO cycle in its extremely hot core. And when it does that, those hot stars ionize the remaining interstellar medium, create those H2 regions we talked about last time, and they completely destroy all of the remaining uh, ga gaseous areas, forming what we saw last time as a Stromgren sphere. That's what high-mass protostars do, and they, they go really fast. The lowest mass protostar, though, can, takes a long time. Something about the mass of the sun takes about two to ten or tens of millions of years, and something two, time, two tenths the mass of the sun can take up to a billion years to form. So there are some protostars that have just started forming, uh, that actually only just formed a billion years ago, or three billion years ago. The Earth's of, the sun's about four and a half billion years ago old, but yet some of those stars formed well after the moon, the Earth was formed, so well after the, the, all the planets were formed, well after all of everything was formed, and even well after the first emergence of life on our Earth. So even after the Sun was formed and all the planets were formed, there were still little M-type stars that were from the solar, from the nebula out of which the Sun formed that still hadn't formed before life formed on Earth. Now eventually, for just low mass stars, that when the core temperature gets about 10, 10 million Kelvin, that's when proton-proton chain fusion, and that's what we talked about in the sun, and the stellar wind also then blows away the cocoon that surrounds it, and there's a remaining disk, and it's gone, and then it becomes a main sequence star. So the end of the protostar phase is the main sequence phase. And what we call that is we call that the zero age main sequence, or ZAMS, which is a great thing. ZAMS, ZAMS, zero age main sequence. The core heats up, hydrogen fusion runs faster and faster, that's where that little kink is in, the, in those tracks, and the core temperature rises and the pressure rises, the collapse slows down, and finally it gets into a total balance where pressure inside equals the gravity outside, that stops the collapse, but it doesn't, but the luminosity is not balanced by the amount of, by the amount, uh, until, until the luminosity of the star is balanced by the energy that's created in the core, you don't have thermal equilibrium. Once both of those have been achieved, well, there's, ther there's thermonuclear fusion in the core, you have, you have, uh, you have hydrostatic equilibrium by pressure balancing gravity, and then you have thermal equilibrium with proton-proton chain providing the energy that's being lost by the luminosity, then you have what's called a zero age main sequence star, and it lives on the main sequence now for another for the sun for 10 billion years before it starts doing things different. Now, there's small the smallest mass that you can possibly have for a star is about eight percent of the mass of the sun. Be below that mass, it's never hot enough to ignite proton proton chain or CNO cycle type hydrogen fusion. And we call those things brown dwarfs. And brown dwarfs are just literally only a little bit bigger than the planet Jupiter. And we call them super Jupiters because their properties are really weird. They do generate energy because of the Kelvin-Helmholtz mechanism by contraction under gravity. And there's not many known, although this is a, this, there's not only a few hundred, but there's now significant numbers that are known because of the wide field, the wide field infrared survey explorer, which is the WISE telescope as well as others like the Spitzer Space Telescope has been able to discover many, many, many of these. So it's not quite accurate to say only a few hundred are known. And they shine almost exclusively in the infrared. And those are what we call the T-dwarf stars. They are the, remember we had the OBGF, OBAF, GKM, L, and T. And the T-type dwarfs are the brown dwarfs. They're just not much bigger than, than, than Jupiter's. And so here's uh, an image from 1995 on the left from the Palomar Observatory looking at a Gliese 229b, which is a brown dwarf orbiting a star. It's just a stellar companion, and it's emitting its own light. It's hotter than Jupiter, right? So it's a star, but it's a brown dwarf. It's not really a star. It doesn't do fusion, so it's a brown dwarf. And the Hubble Field took a Hubble telescope, took a, took a wide field view of it with the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2 or WIFTEC 2 and found and observed this thing, which is a very close by brown dwarf type star. And just to give you a comparison of the sizes of them, we looked at the sun, which is that disk on the left, which is too big for the screen. And we have Barnard star, which is that nearby star with the high proper motion. And Gliese 229 is the little bitty brown dwarf 
or Ecclesi 2 to 9b, as we would call it, is a brown dwarf that's only physically a little bit bigger than Jupiter, but its mass is much greater than Jupiter. So it is shining by gravitational contraction, much more massive than Jupiter, but much more dense than Jupiter. And to give you a comparison, there's the Earth. So those little brown dwarfs, they, they're intensely hot. So if you got close to one, really close, you'd say, wow, that looks like a star. But you have to get really close in order to say, that's a star. Meaning you have to be orbiting it about the same distance that the, that the moon orbits the Earth. So they're really kind of dim. In any event, Gliese 229 is one of the many, uh, many brown dwarfs that are known. There's also a maximum mass. Once it's above you know, 100 to 150 solar masses, it's not really well known. Uh, what this is, but the core gets so incredibly hot that the radiation pressure, meaning the pressure from light itself, is too strong for the gravitational pull, and it gets so incredibly hot, and the radiation is so intense that it actually gives to it rips the star it's apart, and the star becomes unstable. It kind of looks like a lava lamp. There are other there are some examples of such massive stars that literally are disrupting themselves off, and they shed huge amounts of mass until they finally get themselves below. 100 solar masses, but they live such a short period of time that it's a race between shred shredding themselves by radiation pressure or exploding in a supernova. There's really not really a fantastic well-known uh, amount, but it's called the Eddington luminosity, and the Eddington luminosity is the maximum, uh, that's the maximum uh, luminosity that a star can have before it rips itself apart by light. So what do we see out there in the sky? If we look out into the galaxy, there are stars of all different kinds, where we've seen OBAFGKM type stars all over there and L's and T's out there, and we see them in all different life cycles. Now, if the phase is long lived, meaning maybe it lasts billions of years, then we'll see many stars in that phase because there's many more opportunities for a billion years to intersect today. If the phase is extraordinarily short, say 10,000 years or so, we will only see a very few stars in that phase because the probability of a star in that phase being in that phase is very short compared to billion, uh, small compared to that. Now the pre-main sequences phase is longer because of the longer kelvin Helmholtz time scale, so we're going to see mostly low-mass protostars if we see protostars. But actually finding a high-mass protostar is extraordinarily difficult because the time frame is very short for them. But the main sequence phase is what we see most stars in the sky. Almost every, every star you see in the sky is a main se sequence star, except for the, the supergiants and gi giants, which are giant stars. So 80% of the stars in the sky that we see, 70-80% are main sequence. And since that phase is extremely long, we see more main sequence stars in the sky than giants. We also see more main sequence stars than protostars. How long is the main sequence phase? Eh, it just depends. Depends on how this type of star we're looking at. And if we look at the types of stars that we can actually observe in the sky, it's all dependent upon the nature of their masses. Low mass stars, low mass protostars, which are on the lower left as they begin as tiny, tiny protostars, they become brown dwarfs and they stay brown dwarfs. Once a brown dwarf, always a brown dwarf. They don't do anything else except that. Well, that's kind of like a Jupiter sort of thing, a super Jupiter that we saw like Gliese 229b. Uh, more massive brown dwar uh, protostars become red dwarfs, which are M-type stars. And M-type stars stay red dwarfs for a very long period of time. They might swell up a little bit as they age, but eventually they run out of fuel and become white dwarfs. Uh, stars like the Sun, uh, when their protostellar phase, live as main sequence stars for about 10 billion years or so. Oh, and red dwarfs, they last about a trillion years or so. So there are no red dwarfs that have ever become white dwarfs in, in the history of the entire universe. So a, sun, a star like the sun lives 10 billion years, it becomes a red giant and a planetary nebula, and stars a bit more massive than the sun, up to say about eight solar masses, also become planetary nebulae, become white dwarfs. Uh, then stars that are much more massive, like say eight times the mass of the sun, become blue supergiants, then become red giants, then expel huge amounts of material as a blue giant, and go into a supernova phase, which we'll talk about in a few lectures, and they explode, leaving behind a neutron star. Much more massive protostars ex form exceedingly quickly and live a short lifespan of only a few million years before they explode catastrophically as a supernova and leave behind a black hole. But the most massive stars in the 100 solar mass category become blue supergiants, and they, they don't even really leave behind a remnant. 
when they collapse, they might have all sorts of material flowing out of them as part of their life as they shred themselves under the, the radiation pressure. But when they collapse and die, they just go Woof, into a black hole and they're dead. They don't even explode as a supernova, the most massive stars. So the only material that gets out of them is from a large, large shell. But if we look then, we see that there's a process of clouds collapsing on the left to form protostars, then they live their lives. And some of this material goes out to make clouds in the cosmos. And we could easily link the right-hand side of this image with the left. And if we do, we find that, a psych, that stars cycle through clouds and into protostars and then stars and then back to clouds. From ashes to ashes and dust to dust we go, as the phrase is. So stars like the sun are formed when a cloud of dust collapses under its gravitational force, collapses, and its center becomes hotter until fusion begins. And that's our classic idea. Eventually, it forms. The, we do know there's planetary disks that form planets. And at the end of the course, we'll talk about planetary formation uh, and planets themselves. But we're mostly concerned about the formation of the planets and form the protostars into pre-main sequence stars. And we've seen this before when we looked at, at, looked at the giant molecular clouds as well as the H2 regions. We see that such baby stars, such protostars, exist in great profusion in, say, the Triffid Nebula. This is from the Spitzer Space Telescope at, on the right and the Hubble and, uh, and a, a difference from NOAO uh, picture with Hubble insets on the left. And the arrows point to the uh, protostars. But these little tiny protostars are little tiny M and L and T type stars that emit only in the infrared. In fact, on the visible light image, we don't see them all. So these would be L and T type dwarf type stars or, or protostars inside of the embryonic cocoons and still have not emerged. And we also saw that in the Eagle Nebula, there were starburst clouds, and each of these clouds make these evaporating gaseous globules, and we see these little nodules and lumps. And inside each one of those nodules and lumps is a tiny baby star in the process of being formed out of the collapsing cloud. So it's not as pretty or even as symmetric a concept as we might we could possibly imagine. This is a messy, messy, messy concept. And each of those nodules that we see in the, in the top of, of the screen, those things are about 100 times bigger or more than the entire solar system. Whereas the, the cloud itself that we're looking is about a quarter of a light year or half a light year or about a light year across, somewhere in that order. And the light that's emitting and the gas that's coming off of it is because of the hot O and B type stars that are up above, well above it. If you go straight up in this image, you would get to a hot O and B type star that's emitting so much ultraviolet light that it's literally evaporating the, the stellar gas cloud. And so as it evaporates, the dense regions get exposed and those are where the baby stars are forming. And we see the effect of the baby stars forming, and we see jets inside of them. So on the left-hand side, this is from the 2014 revisit of the M16 nebula. We're looking about a two, on the left-hand side about a two-light-year-long uh, cloud. And we can see the effects of the baby stars on their surrounding environments. And on the right-hand side, we see a very, very clear jet from one of these nodules that's kind of sticking out towards us. But there's kind of an up and down jet on the lower right area and a motion of some other jet in a more embedded and more difficult to see cloud in the upper left. But there's this jet, bipolar jet, from some baby cloud, some baby star. So let's go get closer to see what they're doing. First, let's look at the, the what we call a Hayashi track, or the track of a star on the HR diagram. A protostar ends up being an extraordinarily luminous object. Something like the sun, when it was formed as a protostar, would first be at least 100 times the radius of the sun as an object, and would be extraordinarily luminous. It'd be about 10,000 or 10,000 times the luminosity of the sun for a while. And that means that since it's pouring all this energy out, it can't do that for long because, well, it's not doing fusion in the core yet. So that energy is pouring and streaming out of it. And it's also serving to heat up the core as well as being radiated by light. And protostars, are, of course, are not in equilibrium because we start from these big clouds. They collapse down into very, very tiny objects. And the, the time frame that we're looking at uh, to get to a protostar through the protostellar phase, which is in uh, the, the latter side, two sides, from cloud to fragmentation to uh, baby protostar to pre-main sequence star, takes, a, I think, so tens of millions of years or so. So that stellar phase that we looked at, it drops down towards the main sequence as it collapses because 
the luminosity drops as the radius drops because there's lower, lower surface ra so surface area from which it from which it can radiate. So therefore, the luminosity drops. Now, the as the luminosity drops, the temperature doesn't change too much. It gets a little bit warmer on the surface, but the core is rapidly increasing in temperature. It's also becoming much more compact. And then when we get down to the lower area where it gets that hook, it starts to get a little bit more luminous because deuterium fusion ignites deep in the core when it reaches 10 million Kelvin, and that's a form of nuclear fusion. That's just eating up the latent deuterium that was, that was in the cloud from which it formed. That's the protons merging with the deuterium, but that's a later stage in the proton-proton chain that was very easy to do. The big tough thing is the proton-proton chain, and this is, this is serving, the deuterium fusion is serving to heat up the core of the star more, but it's also uh, it, it starting to try to make the star balanced, and it pushes the star along the track, and eventually it gets to the zero age main sequence when it gets hot enough in the core and compact enough in the core for it to be about 15 million Kelvin, and when it does that in the core, then nor then proton proton chain nuclear fusion can occur for the sun and the surface temperature is about 6000 kelvin and now we've got the sun and that whole process along that track took about 10 or 20 or 30 million years and we can see this out in the sky by looking again at these big 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 clouds and the collapsing clouds then get evaporated as the stars are formed and here's what a baby disk a disk might look like around a baby star as it's forming as it forms the disk collapses down into this structure like this and the, some of the material keeps falling into the star giving more mass to the star from the disk and there's a magnetic field associated with the rotation of the of the star in the energy of the ionized portions of the star so it, there is a jet like structure that is seen from the rotational aspect of the entire system, as well as the growth of a very powerful magnetic field. And material can get entrained in that magnetic field and shot out at extraordinary energies because it does not lose the angular momentum. It just simply spirals along those magnetic field lines. And if we were to go deep inside some dark cloud like Barnard 68, we might see something like this with a protostar with an accretion disk around it embedded inside a dark, dark, dusty cocoon. And each one of those dark, dusty cocoons probably has a protostar baby inside it with jets popping out. And that's what we see here, protostellar jets. And this is in a, uh, a dark dust cloud called BHR-71, taken by the Spitzer Space Telescope. And so the VLT image, which is which comes from uh, which, which is a very large telescope, a European Southern Observatory, and then it can be matched up against the Spitzer Space Telescope, which are infrared, and you combine them together. The infrared image in the middle shows the jets and exposes the baby star in the middle of it. And we see in the visible light image that it's punched its way out the backside Outside, outside one side so we can see the jet coming out, but the baby stars form that protostar disk and the jets are coming out from it. So this is possibly what might happen in the core of Barnard 68 in a couple of million years. We also see such jet activities in this amazing view that was taken by Hubble Space Telescope uh, on the 20th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope in 2009 uh, with, when they were looking for specific jets that after the, the the final Hubble servicing mission in 2009, and we see that oh this is this this they called it the the, the castle of wonder uh, the mountains of mountains of, of of wonder I think it was something like that it was some wonderful name like that, but these gaseous pillars are in the presence of other hot stars in the star forming region on the left hand side which is the visible light in the Hubble palette that we've we've come to see many times, and there's lots of jet like structures. In the infrared image on the right, we, most, we can certainly see the warm gas and dust that's entrained inside these jets, and we also don't see much emission from infrared uh, from these nodules that are containing all of the jets. So just look at the top one, way at the top of the image, and we see a jet poking out either side and a very dark nodule that just has a light glow around it because the surface of that is glowing in the infrared but the jets themselves are extraordinarily warm and glowing in the infrared as they shoot out from these baby stars. We can also see from this the, that the, the sky is littered with, with dim red infrared emitting stars, and that's what we see on the right, which, don't, which are not bright enough to even glow in visible light. So the visible light stars appear on the right-hand side, but the infrared cool, cool, cool LNT and, uh, stars do not appear on the left-hand side because they're dim and cool.
So if we look at other kinds of protostars and zoom in, uh, Hubble Space Telescope is fully capable of actually finding and zooming in on these things. And when we look at them, these high resolution or at least high magnification objects, we get down to the point where we're seeing individual pixels on the Hubble Space Telescope's detectors. And each of these things are called like herbig Harrow objects, uh, which are basically young stellar objects. And they're highly variable, they change brightness frequently, and if you're an amateur observer or a, or a variable star observer, uh, young stellar objects are an amazing, amazing treasure trove of wonderfully uh, variable objects. So they're also kind of tiny. And the one on the upper left, Herbig Harrow 30, 30 looks kind of like a uh, donut in a, or, a, or a bagel. Or a hamburger, I guess. I guess it kind of looks like a hamburger with a with a with a with a with a toothpick sticking in it. So you get the but the disc is in the middle of it, and there's a bright emission of dust that's happening above and below. But the disc is incredibly dense and not letting any light out. But we see the jets emitting from either side. Now the disc itself is extraordinarily large, and is about remember the hundred astronomical units is about as far as the Voyager spacecraft has gone since its launch in 1977. So half the width of one of those, of one of those bars is how far the, the Voyager has gone. So in theory, if the Voyager was an ultra-hot object, it could be seen to have moved from the center if it were there, but it's not. This is, but these are what these uh, young, di the, you can see the dark bands, especially in the upper right. The upper right one shows the disk is so incredibly dense that it doesn't let any light out and we see jet-like structures in the lower left, and then uh, we also see, we see contamination by a foreground star, and there's a pair of stars. So stars form in, in we do know stars that form in close binaries, and so here's a close binary in formation, where the upper star in the lower right uh, image is already blown away its cocoon, but the lower left, but the lower right star still has that hamburgery quality with the disk around it, and the jets have been quenched. And here are many, many, many other yellow uh, young star stellar disks, and these are taken with the Hubble Space Telescope with the NICMAS instrument, uh, and these are all taken in infrared. You can see they all show evidence of a bright core surrounded by a disky a disk of material with evidence of of lots of outflow and turbulent atmospheres as as some of the material gets ejected, but much of it gets uh, starts to fall onto the star itself. Uh, specifically, if we look go back to Herbig Harrow 30, we find that the jets actually can be seen to be moving from uh, from year to year, and these circumstellar jets can actually be tracked over the course of years. They don't take long to actually see their see their changes. In fact, uh, Herbig Harrow 47 that was taken by Burroughs and Hester and Morse in this image. Uh, that was released then, they went back and looked at it years later and found that significant fractions of these jets had moved in such a way that it's easily measured uh, with, by revisiting with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here we see uh, a, a hot gas bubble emitted by another kind of young stellar object, and the, the, the protostar is in the lower left. It's a binary set of protostar, and that's being emitted in kind of these globule sort of formats that get ejected out and we can see that they're being ejected by hundreds of astronomical units over the course of a few years. That's an enormous speed. The, the outflow is incredibly fast at 300,000 miles per hour. These are, it's not just a little wind, it's not just this puffy thing. That's pretty fast winds that would make a hurricane look like a, look like a breath of fresh air or a mosquito's wind, wings. But we have the, these, that, they, that because of this, these are extremely variable objects, and the name XZ Tauri indicates that it is a variable star in the constellation Taurus that has been noticed and observed by uh, amateur observers as well, because XZ indicates it, it's been it's one of the lo uh, brighter ones. Here's an incredibly good one, Herbig Era 24, which shows the double jet structure of the protostar still being embedded inside of its nesty cocoon. And the, we can't directly see the, uh, the protostar itself because the dusty disk has not been blown away. But the jets have certainly carved out a certain area along the rotation axis. And there again, we go back and look at the stellar jet in the Carina Nebula. We see a specific object, a young stellar object, uh, in, in visible light on the top. 
and this is again another 2009 image by the Hubble Space Telescope with the wide field, ca wide field camera 3 and the infrared image on the lower portion. We definitely see the jet-like structure puncturing out of the ghostly gas that's just warm enough to emit in infrared, but the jets themselves are extremely warm and show up brightly in infrared. So we get this kind of flow where, where we start with a cloud that's collapsing, but it has a some preferential rotation, just a little bit, and that just a little bit rotation causes it to collapse, but it can't collapse along the, uh, the, uh, along the rot along where it's spinning. So it gets flung out a little bit along the rotation axis, and so it can't collapse radially except along the axis of rotation. It can't collapse in from the disk, but it can collapse along the rotation axis to form a disk. And as it forms that disk then, that disk gets denser and denser and creates and becomes more and more and more ionized, which creates a strong magnetic field. And as material falls onto the protostar, some of it goes into the outflow, and it's, there's a bunch of dusty envelope that still exists around it and the violence of the outflow eventually rips apart the envelope and it reveals the star inside. Some very, very young stellar objects, one of the brightest stars in the, sky, in the southern sky, Beta Pictoris, the second bright star in the constellation of Pictor, was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1998 by, by Schultz and Hippodal with a wide field planetary camera two, and we see a dusty disk surrounding this star and we can see that the disk itself to show the solar system by size scale is much 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 bigger than the entire solar system so these dusty disks can be quite large and we even go and look in for protostars in the Orion Nebula which is the most prominent easy to find nebula with binoculars in the sky and we find these dusty disks throughout the entire uh, the, in our nebula, illuminated because the, the gas of the nebula is illuminated by the hot O and B type stars. And then when the little bitty protostars, the dense disks, are formed, they can show up as dark patches with a bright red core in the middle with the protostar forming inside of them, or the pre-main sequence star in the center of the protoplanetary disk around them. And some of these protoplanetary disks are almost completely shown. And if they're too close to the center of the, of the star nebula, then they will become evaporated and they kind of look like tadpoles. But the jets try to form as they shoot one way. And if the jet for, hit is, can shield the star, the jet can form before the O and B star explodes, it can form actually a shield, which allows the protoplanetary disk to get bigger. And that's kind of the upper left one. Um, but then we look at the at the lower left one. That one's being ablated. It doesn't. Its jet is it would be oriented the wrong way. So the disk is getting eaten away, and so it gets warmer. But the disk is going to get destroyed. So we see that these planetary disks can come in all sorts of rotations, and the streams of particles that come away come out from the trapezium stars as well as the hot ionizing radiation. There's a big, big, big race for against uh, time for these disks to form uh, until, but against the, uh, the irradiation of the, uh, the O and B stars of the trapezium, the four core stars of the Orion Nebula. And here is an incredible view of some really tiny young stars, and each of these would be called protoplanetary disks or, 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 um, or proplids, which is a really funny thing. And th at that distance of about 1,500 light years, this image is only about let just a just a little less than a quarter of a light year across so we're seeing five little protoplanetary disks inside an area that's about a quarter light year across and that's the beginnings of a very 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 loose star cluster and if we zoom in on a particular one we see a protoplanetary disk silhouetted against the Orion nebula it typically isn't green but that's again the Hubble Space Telescope palette which is mostly hydrogen in the background they just call it a green because it makes the redness show up more easily in the protoplanetary disk and we can get even closer to get down into the tiniest fractions of the area uh, of the volume of it by looking at the individual pixels of the Hubble Space Telescope and this material has a huge amount of material it's about eight times the material mass the time almost eight times the diameter of the entire solar system so our entire solar system can be packed into one or two of the uh, or three or four of the pixels in the center and this particular star birth field is approximately 1,500 light years away. The, this is the Orion Nebula, which is easily visible in telescopes. And this is only about a, less than a million years old, maybe a few hundred thousand years old. And the size of this thing is really small. 
and we can actually see the very beginnings of star of planets being formed around other stars in dis dark, disky, uh, dusty patches. And there it is, that little tiny little thing embedded inside the Orion Nebula, and that's what we call a proto a proplanet or a protoplanetary disk. And they're in scads there. You go, you look in the hunt, you hunt around inside that thing. You see gazillions of them inside the nebula, because the Orion Nebula is a star-forming factory. And you can see all of them have these disky structures. And remember, the Kepler Space Telescope showed us that there are basically planets around every star. So here are the disks of the planets that will one day, the disks that one day will become planets in these stellar systems. So there's what we mean by that image, and that's where that artist's image comes from, because no one's ever seen one this close, and that no one's ever seen one high resolution like this. That one with the green background is as high a resolution as we're ever going to get. But this is the image of the artist's conception of what it might look like if we were up close. Again, we have the HR diagram to just kind of bring it home. The more massive the star, the faster it rushes along its track, and the higher up it ends on the main sequence. And we look again at these tracks, it takes maybe for something a half the mass of the sun, 150 million years to form from a, from a cloud all the way down to a star. The sun might take 30 to 50 million years, something more massive than the sun might take 3 million years, but something really massive might take 60,000 years, and upwards of the 30 to 50 solar mass stars take on the order of a 10,000 years or less. And that's where we get the main sequence from. The main sequence comes from all of these stars in the sky that once formed planets. But when we take the stars in the sky, we get giants, supergiants, and white dwarfs, and these are evolved portions of the main of, of, of the sky. And that's what we see with our with uh, in the deep in the sky is our main uh, with, is the entire set of stars minus the protos protostars. Protostars tend to be very difficult to find, so we don't include them in the HR diagram because they're not yet stars. All right. So protostars themselves, just to summarize the entire thing, they take uh, tens of millions of years to form for something about the size of the size mass of the sun. The central temperature goes from being extraordinarily cold to up to 15 million Kelvin. The density goes from being basically a couple hundred particles per cubic centimeter to 10 to the 21st first times more dense and millions of times hotter and the diameter shrinks by a factor of a factor of, of 100 million so that it can form a star. So stars start loose, something pops, pushes them apart, they fragment, form protostars, those protostars collapse under gravity, emitting their light as they collapse under gravity and heat up. Eventually they, they do some form of nuclear fusion, meaning deuterium fusion, but they don't do proton-proton chain until they finally get to 15 million Kelvin. And so protostars are the things that are formed from these giant molecular clouds, and we see these baby stars all throughout wherever we look inside the H2 regions, which is, that's why we call the H2 regions star-forming regions.